world, my name's Data Mining Mike, and on this episode of the podcast, we are going to talk about how to start a drone business. Today's guest is John Romero. John is a drone expert, and he has the Spokane market cornered in overhead LiDAR ground survey drones. We discuss an array of topics related to drones, such as drone warfare to commercial drone applications. This is a very educational conversation that will open your eyes to the capabilities of drones in a fast-moving world of tech. I am highly confident at the end of this period of instruction, you will be able to take what you learn and apply it to drones, and that's called value. And because of that, you should like this video and John's videos too. Be sure to subscribe and smash that bell for more data-driven updates. But first, this episode of the podcast would like to recognize a boring but good company called Sherwin-Williams, ticker symbol SHW. Paint is a staple of human civilization, and no other paint company does it better than Sherwin-Williams. If the economy is booming, people buy paint for all new buildings. When the economy is busting, people stay inside and paint their homes. Sherwin-Williams is a very buoyant stock and a must-add purchase to your investment portfolio. Sherwin-Williams, ticker symbol SHW. I'm John Romero with Scout Aerial Solutions, LLC. So it's a uh, drone and geospatial service provider company um, in the local region here in Spokane. That's who I am. I do drone stuff and sometimes laser scanning on the ground. Talk about how did uh, Vegas go? Oh, Vegas. Yeah. So um, that was also with my more full-time job, Moss Geospatial Solutions. Um, I'll have to make that mention because that's a there's a big clarity between the two. Um, but Vegas with MGS was actually really, really, really good. Um, uh, it was definitely a lot more. Um, how do I put this? It was a lot more to take in than I thought it would be. Because at first, just going to Vegas, because I've never been to Vegas. Oh, and then really? I've never been to a convention either oh, in Vegas. For it was an extensive amount of information and everything to take in. Like, I'm also surprised the amount of walking we did. Mm -hmm. um, just you, you either take an Uber and then you walk everywhere else you go. And then going inside of the malls is like going inside of a micro city. Um, and so you're walking like a small city within a city inside of a building, um, which just it's ludicrous but yeah so we got there got got checked in did a little bit of walking around vegas um and then we checked into the convention it was at the uh commercial uav expo and holy cow like I, I was really trying my hardest that first day to try to record myself get media of the event and i <laughs> i haven't gone through all the media but there's one video in there where you see me just walk entering into uh, the expo and I'm like hey I gotta put the camera down like I can't do both of these things at the same time and that the rest of that first time was just going up and down the aisles and just looking at all of the drones that were there the software the data collection tools and stuff like that like everything a lot of brand new stuff um, a lot of stuff I haven't seen even some old stuff that's been there a, a while um, but there was some new concept drones that had come out too from from some well-known companies uh, like Autel, they had a really nice concept drone there. That was a that was a huge one. Um, but I was the I think the cooler part is I was able to go with um, one of MGS uh, MGS's partners, Whisper, uh, and attend a reveal for one of their new drones, the uh, Whisper Systems Sky Scout, which is if anybody knows drones is the equivalent to like an M thirty, um, but made in America, and you can swap out the camera systems that are on there too. Um, it's foldable, it goes in a backpack like, um, you know, you, you were at the School of Infantry, right? Like mm -hmm. imagine having a little backpack, like a robust backpack drone that you could mm -hmm. swap payloads on and just send them out wherever, wherever you want to go with them. So like uh, essentially like... Um, being able to throw like a thermal on there or being able to throw like a laser scanner or something like that and be able to get quick, quick information. That's also where everything is going. Cause yeah, it's dude, really exciting. You know what I met? I met some guys from AR tech, AR tech while I was at the convention. So what they do is they do 
um, virtual reality sand tables. Okay. On the fly. Interesting. So, so check this out. The way that they have it is they have it to where you can take a drone, you fly over an area, you can take really fast, quick imagery or laser scan imagery. You'll take that data, and what it'll do is fast, like ingest and process of the data in the field. So, like, you'll get it back in like 15 minutes. And then you'll go ahead and put on some AR or VR goggles or glasses, and you're immediately able to get a sand table going just based off of that. So, like, you can then tell your command team, like, okay, cool, pull it on the goggles and glasses 10, you know, 15, 30 minutes later, they've got their data. They can start planning. No, no private has to go out there and start shuffling dirt around, and then you got to sanitize the area later. Like everything is all in one, and you could ship that data back to command. You could ship that data, you know, to like a schoolhouse or something like that. Like it's it's some pretty wild stuff. Um, but that was that that's something I thought was awesome, and I'm like, man, we <laughs> we need to start using this more. I think both for my military career on on the back end here and then also anything going forward because they want to get into construction too and i think that we great for construction companies is being able to get not necessarily the half processed data but like the full processed stuff and then being able to throw it inside of like a classroom and then walk around that or even be out in the field and be like okay we need to see how the construction site's going and they just put on some glasses like oh look this is going all right or this is going kind of horrible you know, they actually can get eyes on way better and actually see to scale how the job site's going without ever leaving the office or the job shack. So that would be cool. I'd love to see that going. But all in all, I would say Vegas was Vegas was definitely pretty great. Uh, we got to go to the Omega Mart too. I think like our second to last day, we did that at like seven o'clock at night. I don't know if you've ever seen the Omega Mart. Mm-hmm. So it's it's like um, you go in there. And it's like a store that is entirely off. Like everything's off. All the products are off. Um, like what What are some of the products that they have? Um, like a bunch of the, they have a whole like pill bottle section and it's like everything's made with mints in there. Like every, all the, all the pills are technically mints. You can buy everything that's inside of this like experience. Um, but like the toothpaste there is called protein toothpaste. And it was like every, every time you brush with this toothpaste, it has like 600 grams of protein or something like that. Hmm. So it's like weird, weird stuff in the store. Um, the cleaning products look like small animals. Um, the vegetables were like hollowed out or alive or like they had, uh, strawberry pretzels. Um, just some weird stuff in there. And then of course the, the whole big thing thing of this is that the store is actually a front to like an alternate dimension or a dream dimension so like if you go to the back and you open up the um <clears throat> you open up the coca-cola case or the omega mart cola case if you will there's actually a doorway that goes all the way into the back of the omega mart and then you appear in like a like a um like a small village and now you have other stuff and the whole place has like an interactive story um, phones that you can use, like the whole thing is touch that you, like very, very, um, sensory related. It's super cool. And then of course, if you want to buy souvenirs from the place that it's actually in the Mart, you can buy, you know, cups, mugs, some of the weird stuff. Uh, like, uh, one of the cleaning products I, I, uh, I really liked that they had there was just called done. It's just oh. done. It's just <laughs> done. It's done. <laughs> like, <Damn. laughs> Um, but yeah, it was just super odd. I would, I would always implore anybody at one, if you go to Vegas, go to the, I think it's called meow wolf, uh, Omega Mart and just experience it or two, just look it up online. Cause it's really cool. Um, but it's a very, like you could, you could spend a whole day there and just go over like the story if you wanted to. Cause like it, one is just taking in the sites and seeing how things are and the tourist attraction of it too. But then like, if you start going through like the bookshelves, and like people's drawers and stuff like that. There's a whole story. Like there's, there's, there's books of what has happened and why the Mart is the way it is, and like why all these dimensions have been pulled together into the like uh, from a company called like DreamCore. And so, like you could you could take these books and start reading through them, and like they're they're in plain sight. They're not hard to find, but because they're in plain sight, they look like they match with everything. So everybody blows over them. So like I sat down in a chair 
in one of the little huts. And I looked over on the bookshelf and I'm like, those are normal books. And I'm like, wait a minute, this one's got weird drawings on it. So I pulled that out. And sure enough, it was the backstory of that exact building and like what the people were doing in the building and why the masks were on the wall. And like it went through even the building that's over on the other side. But that other building had lore of its own of what was going on in that specific area and why it got pulled in. Like, it's super cool. Yeah. Damn. Yeah. That sounds like <laughs> it would be a really fun place to check out. Yeah. You put that on my bucket list. Now. Yeah. It's it's super cool. So. The Omega Mart. The Omega Vegas. Mart. Yeah. And I was just thinking, like, what's your favorite Vegas hotel? And then you're talking about the Omega Mart. Yeah. Like, that sounds even more fun than, like, the Ice Bar and yeah. those other well, things. and the cool part is they have a bar right outside of that. So, like, it's part of the Area 15. So, like, you go in there, and it's more like an adult entertainment center, but without a strip club or anything like that. It's just an adult entertainment center. You know, they have arcades. They have um, a lot of, like, artistic experiences, Omega Mart being one of them. Um, and then they have a bar. They have a restaurant. Like, it, it's a whole thing, <laughs> you know? Um, so it's, it's really cool. You just go in there and it's just mostly a huge art installation. Um, and the Omega Mart is really the main experience to that. And so again, you could just, you could spend all day in that one facility, maybe a couple days just to find everything and like, just have the time of your life. Um, I would say though, as far as like hotels and stuff, we really didn't go to a lot of the hotels. Um, we passed through a lot of the casinos, mm-hmm. but we were just so busy dealing with the convention mm-hmm. that a lot of times it was like, okay, cool. We'll go to the convention. Then we went and did a walk of the strip. Um, and that was pretty cool. Cause I guess that's something you do when you go to Vegas is you got to walk the strip at least once, go up and down the strip, see mm-hmm. how it is. Um, I would say probably the funniest part is I got to have, um, I got to have a Mountain Dew Baja blast with rum in it. Mm-hmm. Because they had a Taco Bell there. And the Taco Bell, you can get alcohol in it. It's the only one you can get alcohol in. And I'm like, okay, it's pretty good. And I was joking about the Baja Blast, but it was it was real. It was legitimate. <laughs> it actually happened. Um, so that, that was a fun time. That was a real good time. But yeah, so um, convention was really cool, though. That's just being able to see all those drones in one place. And like some of them were super big, heavy lift drones. Mm-hmm. Like, holy cow. There's like giant, there's these giant like laser LIDAR, LIDAR setups. That's what, what LIDAR is, is light detection and ranging. Um, for anybody who's listening, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a, essentially a laser scanner, but you're also detecting the reflection of light and then the distance from that too. That's what you're recording in that. So it'll give you super accurate scans of whatever you're doing. And so some of these are like, like, I would say they're like 15, 20 pound scanners and normally drones don't lift that much. So you need like a heavy lift drone just to lift that. Um, and they're getting immaculate data sets. I mean, they didn't really fly any there cause it's, it's Vegas. You're not going to really get a lot of clearance. And if you do, there's, there were some videos that came out of Vegas that I saw and I'm pretty sure they, they all came out around the same time as the convention. So there are some people who are probably in trouble with the FAA because I don't think they actually got clearance. There's only one guy who got clearance. That was that was Vic Moss. Um, he got a really nice like 360 photo of of uh, what was it the 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 water jets. I don't remember what they called the water jets that are on the strip that they they go with the music oh, and everything. The Mirage. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So he got a good 360 photo over over the water jets and the that's mirage cool. yeah and i was like it's fantastic so that's the only guy that i know was able to legally fly on the strip everybody else was probably breaking some laws so yeah yeah man, that's a whole lot. well you made me think of a lot of things one let's go back to the creation of terrain models oh yeah that's freaking awesome yeah like you could actually get accurate <clears throat> terrain models and you can plan out like fire preparation like when when, what targets you're gonna shoot on because you actually have the correct elevation yeah exactly yeah yeah and you're not guessing and you can have pre-plan i mean you could literally do that you can Mm -hmm. have pre-planned data for every single target even for mortar gunnery oh yeah exactly like as long as you have that like as long as the drone's got gps data Mm -hmm. and you're able to somehow reference it to a ground point somewhere you could get within a meter easily like, 
of course, being able to do any kind of artillery, 50 meters is really the kill zone. So, mm -hmm. like, it doesn't really... As long as you can hit the building, you're mm -hmm. good to go. Um, but, I mean, even then, it's like, you don't have to get sat-nav data now. You could just rely on, like, small teams to go and collect this stuff because we all know space is starting to get contested nowadays. Like, um, and it's super gargled with other information. And there's, you know, sensors are good up there, but some of them are too old. Um, but being able to get a small drone, like a small team and just say, Hey, we just need to get ISR of this area real quick and then create that accurate terrain model, essentially to be able to do any missions. Like you'll definitely know what's there. Like you're getting as is conditions right then and there. So you'll know if the building has been bombed out or not or whatever. And any team can access that. And that's, that's really cool. And it, Ooh, also, fun fact, it also syncs up with ATAC. So RTAC and ATAC are kind of two different things, but they also sync up with each other. So RTAC is the AR, like, command and control portion, whereas ATAC is the, goes straight to the infantryman portion. Um, and ATAC allows you to be able to have essentially a map on, like, a phone that's mm. hooked up back to your command that's, you know, your your company command, not your, um, not your squadron or your oh, i'm thinking scout terms squadron and troop are all scout stuff <laughs> but um your 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 battalion or something like yeah, that yeah, yeah not your not company yeah hire. yeah not back to hire it's just with you and they could send that information up to hire but it's just it's your your bounds so instead of having to carry around a map a protractor compass and stuff which i always implore you should probably do because yeah. you never fully depend on technology no. like i love technology but you always have that old stuff with you. Mm -hmm. You just got to, like, the new stuff is super fast and quick if you need operations. You can't but be as good as your battery life. No, you exactly. Be better than your battery you got to be better than your battery life, 100%. Mm -hmm. um, so they have, so ATAC allows you to be able to have a map, and it'll actually show you where all your guys are on the map, and they could even take a photo with, like, the phone and then send that to anybody else. So you can share live feed battle data, essentially, with anybody in your squad, your team, or, you know, anybody up higher, too, if necessary. So it keeps it keeps everything kind of good. And since RTAC and ATAC talk to each other, they can plan the mission, and then that gets immediately downloaded to, to ATAC. And now there you go. Your mission's been planned. You don't have to redo your graphics or anything. They're just there. <laughs> and you're good to go. And then if the mission changes, if they plan it in RTAC, it goes back over to ATAC. And now you got your Frago. Frago changes out live. So Battlefield is starting to get quicker, which is super nice. But again, always, again, make sure you got a manual process. Because <laughs> I, I cannot stress that enough because I've had that happen so many times too where I'm like, where the heck am I? All right, let's get my little GPS out. Let's just get a grid coordinate. And then we'll plan everything manual from there. Honestly, I like using maps a little bit more. Like, I love technology, but I really love using maps. Mm -hmm. There's just something something really controllable about being able to know where you're at and then planning your fans of fire and then also saying, hey, this is where our distance and direction's at. This is our limit of engagement. Mm -hmm. And then even from that, you're like, since you know all of this, now you can just do call for fire based off of, you know, triangulation. Like, I know where I am at. I know where that target's at. I know where that target's at. So they're somewhere in between here. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. <laughs> like you, you almost become like a little LRAS. It's super cool. I love it. Absolutely love it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I like that. And you were talking. I, I just kept thinking like as a mortarman. Mm -hmm. So as a mortarman for majority of my I, I love mortar guys. Yeah, they're awesome. <laughs> hey, that. Uh, it was an interesting job, that's for sure. But <laughs> there, you with that lidar that creates the terrain model, mm -hmm. you could then have every single all the gun data planned out. Yes. And then your only issue is hoping that you put the gun in exactly where it goes. Mm -hmm. But yeah, no, it's cutting out a lot of guesswork, which yeah. is really freaking cool and sexy. Yeah. It cuts out a ton of the guesswork. So yeah, that's unfortunately it's not like live feed data, which I, it will eventually probably be live feed of like you could fly over with LIDAR and it'll just go and spatter the whole thing with with laser points. And you're like, oh, hey, 
that's where the tank sat because at least right now you got to fly that thing over come back and by then the tank might have moved so you still have to have you know eyes on target of course but still being able to get that actual elevation data like you wouldn't have to worry about nothing you don't have to worry about weird laser returns because the laser's shooting out like a million points a second you're getting underneath the trees anyway so you're gonna know exactly how, exactly where the ground is at so super fast super quick and that's that's actually something i was gonna make mention that new sky scout um that's what they were planning with whisper systems is actually putting a little lidar payload on there so no color but just the lidar um puck on there and then everything's all culminated with the actual gps thing on the top and you should be able to it even it'll even have the calibration flight put into it so any any essentially any joe that's on the ground would be able to take this thing off hit the cal flight it'll do its thing and then you can say okay cool go do your map mission and it'll fly out there at like i think i think the m2x which is the lidar payload is able to go up to like uh, 200 meters I think it's like 200 meters up which is a pretty fair distance into the sky and able to like map out an area fairly quickly like 10 10 20 miles an hour so you could get some pretty fast data out of that hugely fast data so it's good stuff <laughs> yeah it's exciting and it's something that I've been watching in Ukraine with the war oh, Ukraine, yeah. how drones because that's totally new. To it me. is. That, like the use of kamikaze drones. Oh, yeah. And uh, just watching them dropping mm -hmm. grenades from drones into tanks. Yeah. Which is really freaking awesome. Oh, yeah. The the loiter munitions they've been coming up with, those are, whoo. Like, I was seeing them do that. They're getting a little bit, like, little bigger um, FPV drones. And then what they'll do is they'll actually put like an RPG round just directly underneath it. And then they'll just fly it directly into the tank, right where the weak spot's at. Because you can see the weak spot. It doesn't even matter anymore. Like you're not like trying to guess. You just throw the RPG round on there and you just slam it right into the tank and it mm -hmm. doesn't even matter. Um, which that is an interesting war in general. And I'll be honest, I truly believe um, and I, it's kind of plain to see, too, it's um, that the U.S. is looking at that war and like, oh, shoot, we need to figure out how to actually use drones because the U.S. has actually been severely far behind in the use case of drone technology. Like, in all honesty, Ukraine is way farther ahead. Like, they are technically pioneering a new form of warfare that nobody has done before. Yeah. Like on the small level. Yes. The small drones. Yeah. And not the, not the big old mm -hmm. predators. Yeah. It's, it's the small scale squad to team level drone mm -hmm. combat. Um, shoot. I've even heard of the Ukraine with trench yeah. warfare. Yes. Too, yeah. Which makes it really unique. Trench warfare is back. <laughs> like, yeah, that's, that's nuts. The fact that trenches came back out of nowhere. Yeah. Yeah. It's a brutal way to, Fight. Yeah. 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 It's it's muddy. It's dirty. Like it's better than having your head above water. But uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't like that. I I like the last war we had where it was sand. <laughs> we had all of our ground armor and our aerial assets. Yeah. I mean that wasn't very a very good war. We kind of pulled out a little bad, but. Mm -hmm. A lot bad. <laughs> Are you talking about Afghanistan? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was in, where were you at in Afghanistan? I, I was back home at oh, that okay. point. Yeah, I was back home. But after like the deployment I went on in Bahrain was kind of, eh, you mm -hmm. know, and then after we got back and then I saw the pullout, I'm just like, guys, <laughs> You're really not buying me on wanting to keep my contract. <laughs> like, <laughs> There's going to be a lot of people getting out and not wanting to get back in because of this. And that's exactly what happened. There's a ton of people who got out of the army just because of that. Like people didn't agree. Like it, well that, and also like the COVID mandates too, that was a big one. Um, so it's, it, it was just a combination of like bad deployments, bad policies, bad pull out most people just said all right we've, we've had enough you guys apparently have no idea what you're doing and we don't want any any deal with it and so now we're we're hurting for recruiting efforts mm -hmm. um 
which is horrible. But I mean, you reap what you sow, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. Don't don't do messed up stuff. I mean, I know we're the military; it's kind of par for the course. But yeah, yeah, don't do messed up stuff. Um, back to the drone thing, though. Yeah. Let's get on a lighter note. Yeah. Not really a lighter note. But, no worries. Um, well, it's all drone related. Exactly, right? The other. No, but like, so I will say the the Ukraine drone warfare, that's pretty brutal. It's pretty awesome in the sense that like they have multiple tiers of drones and the U.S. hasn't even conceived on how to be able to do this warfare. Fun fact. ISIS is the one that pioneered this kind of warfare. Yeah. yeah. I, you know what? I thought of that, too. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a so 2016 was the first time that ISIS used a grenade mm -hmm. to be able to essentially use they used a phantom, a phantom from from DJI. DJI is not the bad guy here. They're they are just the tool that got used because they are a small, cheap commercial like Kinda UAS like the Toyota truck. Exactly. <laughs> <So. That's, laughs> DJI is the Toyota of <laughs> of warfare. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's horrible, but true. Um but yeah, so like uh, they they use a small DJI drone and dropped it inside of a tur turret for immense results. Um, to this day, um, I think we've started to get better, but to this day, I have not seen really any good doctrine on how to deal with drones. Like I think the last infantry manual I saw was just like run and hide, find a tree and run and hide or get glow to the ground, like spread out because the farther away you get from each other, if it drops one grenade, it's only going to maybe get one of you guys. Um, but as soon as the drone leaves, you need to leave because that means either more drones are coming or they're going to bring reinforcements. Like, your position's compromised. Um, but there isn't any good combat right now to it. There is some counter UAS stuff that's out there. You know, like, they got the big drone guns, like drone busters and stuff like that. But... Even then, we're on the cusp of, like, swarm technology with all the lawyer munitions and everything. And it's like, yeah, at some point, this is going to become, like, I think, I think, I honestly think armor might end up becoming a little bit more kind of off to the side. Just because how is a big giant tank going to defeat a swarm of drones? Well, it'll help to an extent, but you're going to need smaller, lighter, infantry-style like we're going to go kind of backwards in history where now we're going back to infantry style stuff. Um, and actually it shows too, because the, the army recently released a new uh, infantry fighting vehicle. That's like a hybrid between the Bradley and the Abrams. Mm. Um, so it's got a so main tracked vehicle. Yeah. It's a track vehicle. It's called the, Oh shoot. I want to look this up. What is that new one? Let's see. New army. Uh, tank. We'll just call it tank. Somebody will get mad at me. It's the N10 Booker. N M10 Booker. Okay. It's M10, M10 Booker. Booker. Look that up, Booker. So, yeah, Ooh, yeah. That's been something that uh, the death of tank warfare. Yeah, has been. It seemed it, it died many years ago, mm -hmm. that, and it was shown with ISIS when just our older generation rocketry was just destroying Russian tanks. Yeah. And then we see how tanks basically are not good for speed and maneuverability, yeah. and they're just big targets. And, yeah, and so it's pretty much the death of tanks, it seems. Yeah. Um. And now it's now it's a matter of how. And I thought about this too. How do you counter those drones? Yes, because I've been watching these videos mm -hmm. and I've been listening to these these people do their after actions and their their reactions to it. Yeah. And, and one of the worst <clears throat> things that that these people are like the if you're getting attacked from a drone mm -hmm. is to go into a some sort of a fighting hole or a bunker. Yeah. When yeah, you're better off just to spread out and get as much dispersion as you can. Mhm. Mm and then because I, I think about like a counter to any sort of like even a plane attack is yes. to get online and spread out mm -hmm. and lay down and shoot up in the air. Yeah. Which seems like that would be a more effective way to go. 
<laughs> and then I'm watching these videos of these Russians just shooting at this drone. Mm hmm. And I think, man, you guys suck. Yeah. How can you not hit these things? It, it is it is surprisingly hard to hit a drone. Like even so, I I, I went through some of the training, a little bit of the training, uh, when I went to Bahrain, uh, in on pre deployment, and some of the stuff they were saying is like, so as far as the doctrine was back in 2019, um, was essentially like you spread out, you get on the ground, and then if you can, if you're in the open angle up and fire at the drone in a safe direction because you don't want to try to cross fire on each other. Mm. Um, but try, try to fire at the drone. But they even said it may even just be better not to shoot at it because they might be trying to waste your ammunition uh, because it is sufficiently hard to actually nail a drone from distance um, while it's in the sky. And it's like, even then like uh, going through Raven course and stuff like that, um, being able to relocate your drone in the sky, like even if it's your own drone, you will lose it in the blue like that. Just super, as soon as you move your eyes off to the right or left or down, you look down, look up, drone's gone. It could be in the same location, but it's just the way the human brain works. Like you have to narrow down that blue sky into like a box or something, um, like a small box with your fingers. Um, and then you're able to search that box and it's really easy to find whatever's in there. But as you're looking at everything, it's super hard to be able to do. Um, that's so, a good point. Yeah. And so that's that's a, that's the a thing is it's like um and even then it's um what were they taught taught us this little pen trick too. Um and I think it was I'll take a little pen out here, not that anybody can see it right now, but essentially if you were able to take the ballpoint pen and you looked up and you saw the drone at the tip of your ballpoint pen, it was like the drone was 400 meters away. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So, so you it was, range estimate. You, you could range this estimate with your ballpoint pen. And then it, it, I think if you took it down though, if it, it was like this, it's like the drone is like 50 meters away. So like there's a significant change between just pen up or pen, like pen down significant change in distance. And so that, and that's for like a phantom. That's like for a phantom DJI phantom drone, like that size. So how big of a DJI phantom drone is this? So how big are they? Oh, the phantoms are like, uh, I would say maybe about, a foot in height by a foot in width or so something okay. like that okay so these are so the, it's one foot cubed i guess we could do, go with that <laughs> so they're not crazy big um and they're getting smaller more nimble with better battery life better range and better lift capability um so like mostly now we're using the mavic style drones um and that's what you're seeing in like ukraine it's tons of people using mavic style drones or even worse they're using FPV modified drones, um, which are really cheap, effective to make. Like you could make a, a decent FPV with like 300 bucks and have that thing will go like 90 to 100 miles an hour plus. Like that's spooky if you think about it. Like that's how the how like no, I, I'm I've sure seen you've seen you've drones, seen it. they're man, freaking it going. They're going. It is fast, and they're just uh, like uh, I, I've heard that one of the there's a company that's building disposable FPV drones that are built to be loiter munitions, specifically with a bomb built inside of them. Um, and they're going to be essentially it's part of it's this company's helping build part of Ukraine's plan, like uh, for ground movement is that every soldier will have one FPV drone on them. So instead of one grenade, every soldier has an FPV drone with a grenade on it. Like, <laughs> well, you're talking about that. And I was thinking, what if you had like FPV drones continually circling your patrol to yeah. protect you from the other drones? Yes. That would just kamikaze, like see a drone, mm -hmm. identify kamikaze. Boom. And, and that would be, honestly, I think that's the best way to be able to actually like I think that might be the only way to combat some of these is either a like uh, you're going to have to have some kind of, Oh gosh, now I'm going to get stabbed here. Um, but it's going to be a, um, you either have a, you have to have some kind of radio detection, like blanket over you, uh, over your element. And then that radio detection blanket is going to have to be able to detect distance and direction and deploy either a physical drone or some kind of laser munition uh, to be able to disable the drone in flight. Because what you're trying to do is just at least knock out like a propeller. You want to get one propeller knocked off because that thing will drop at, as soon as you get one of those propellers. If it's a fixed wing, you need to take a wing off because that'll then throw the whole thing out of flight. Because one of the things that they're doing is um, we, used, we used to, or we still do, 
use like the Duke's, I think it's called the Duke system. It's, it used to be for IED uh, disablement. You know, it's like a big backpack. Yeah, yeah. we called it the Thor. That but thing, I yeah. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. yeah, that Duke system might have been that detection one. I forgot what it was called. Yeah, but it, it's yeah. an ECM that yeah. pushes out. And, that's, and like it's it. the same thing with like the drone buster guns um, where they shoot out essentially like a, um, you know, a radio signal that helps down the drone. Problem is that with these, the drones that they're using in like Ukraine and stuff, and they actually we're using them in ISIS too, is that they would just have a dummy switch on them. And the dummy switch would mean, oh, hey, I'm getting into that, uh, like the radio kill radius where you start losing signal and all that. They just throw the dummy switch and it turns into a dummy bomb and it just plows right into it. And that radio disablement equipment becomes completely ineffective at that point because there's no way to return the drone home or down the drone from, from whatever the, you know, the, um, what is it? Whatever the pilot was doing, you just go ahead and flip that dummy switch and the whole thing just turns into a dummy bomb. It's like, I know what my course is and I'm just going to stay my heading. doesn't matter what comes into my interference. I'm just going to keep going unless I hit something or something shoots me down. So (laughs) it becomes extremely hard to be able to counter these. You need something physical or you need some kind of laser equipment to almost, you know, pop up and then shoot whatever's coming at it. But if you have swarm tech, that's, that that might be almost impossible to counter, at least for right now, because swarm tech, the swarm swarm would rely on communication probably between the drones, unless they were using optical, um, optical obstacle avoidance to be able to essentially shift off of each other, so they're not crashing into each other, because that would be the big issue with swarm tech is crashing into each other causing the whole swarm to essentially be ineffective. But if you're able to then take that swarm and plow that into like a tank or something like that like you don't need a lot of big munitions you just need enough small munitions to plow into it all in the same spot that could take down darn near any target you know it's like having a it's like having a you know a a minigun or something like that if you will i mean a minigun against an abrams is still not going to work but it'll work against most targets (laughs) definitely against most targets um but i think Especially, uh, I would say, too, although on the tank warfare, we have seen that, like, Russia's tanks are just bad. They're just really bad. <laughs> like, they haven't updated anything. Um, they had the whole Armada series that they kept boasting, and that, that was just... With the cardboard freaking yeah. uh, armor. Yeah. They're like, oh, we've got these Armada tanks. They haven't seen a single one of them, because they don't exist. Um, they haven't done nothing with that, but... I know the Abrams is definitely like Abrams and a lot of NATO tanks where they're built way, 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 way better than that. And we haven't seen them in real good combat since like Desert Storm, um, at least that I'm aware of. I don't know of any other conflicts we've had that was like really, really armor centric. And Desert Storm, we wiped the battlefield with the with the Abrams. But being in really soft mud and stuff like that, like up in Ukraine, one, that would hamper any kind of armor we have. And then two, how do you defeat the drones? Because even then, like, yeah, the Abrams can have the best tank, tank armor in the world unless a hatch is open. And in, in that case, it doesn't even matter. <laughs> mm-hmm. If the hatch is open, the drone's going in it. That's right. Oh, and gosh. And that was, is continually talked yeah. about in the videos. Like, why are they leaving the hatches open? Yeah. And, like, it's, and yeah. This is, that's Russia's fault for having these mm-hmm. horribly trained troops. Well, it's bad trained troops, and then it's also bad equipment. Like, for yeah. us, we have now those, like, cool crow systems on top of the, of the, the Abrams tanks. So that way you don't even have to have the hatches open anymore. But like 90% of the time, if you want to want to maneuver, you have to have a hatch open because typically you don't have any way for the commander to see out and call targets without the hatch. Or you do have the periscopes, but the periscopes don't give you the breadth of the terrain that's there. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas now we have those like crow systems that are on top of the uh, on top of our Abrams and Bradleys and stuff like that, which allow the commander to see quite, uh, quite a lot. And then they usually put like a gun on there too. So now the commander can shoot back, Mm -hmm. (laughs) but um, yeah, no, that that's been kind of the issue. Cause like I, I used to be a Bradley crewman uh, in my first platoon uh, when I first got to my, my unit way, way back in the day. Um, and that's something that I found out is like the Bradley guys, like at a certain point, you're just going to have to go up outside. Cause as a commander, you can't really see what's around you with the way that everything's built. 
So that's kind of the same thing with the Russians, except they have worse visual line of sight in their tanks. Their tanks were not really built for modern warfare. They were built for back in the day where you'd have one commander up or kind of looking around like you know, you've seen fury where mm-hmm. they're kind of sitting there looking around like that's kind of how tank warfare mm-hmm. has been mostly fought and you mm-hmm. only button up when you're going directly at somebody but as soon as you're ready to move commander comes out to be able to look around and see what's going on mm-hmm. that and it also gets really hot in those tanks like they don't have ac mm-hmm. so usually they have to have a hatch open otherwise they're dying of of you know something there's no mm-hmm. fresh air getting in there um but it creates a huge weak spot, especially for any kind of loiter munition. Like, what was it? I saw um, I saw one video where you see one drone where it gets really up close to the tank, and it's just sitting there. It gets right over top of the uh, of the cupola, and it just dives in. It takes a little, ooh, like a little dive. It was almost silly, except it had a giant freaking RPG round on there, and it mm-hmm. dove in and hit right directly on top of, the, like, the loader. And the whole thing was gone. <laughs> like... Mm-hmm. But it's like, that's how easy they're able to enter in. They almost walk the drone right into the top of those things because you can't hear nothing either. You just can't hear nothing. You usually have like a CVC helmet on or the engine's going or something's going on. And it's, you can't, you can't hear nothing. But also the, de- also the design of those uh, Russian tanks is horrible because they have the auto loader system in there. So all of the rounds are directly inside of that thing, like where the crew is at. So... It, it's just a giant like firework ready to go off in the first place. So um, our tanks are built a bit different than that because we have a wet rack that's actually like closable, but that still would kill the crew if we had a little RPG that went in there. It would disable every, but everything. Like the driver might be left. The driver might be able to get out of there, but <laughs> everybody else in the turret would be gone. So, Not to mention the concussion. Yes. Yeah driver might be disabled just because of that so yeah. and look and that's just tanks yeah and, and so that's just you, tanks with drones and, and that's just <laughs> tanks with drones warfare is asymmetrical and yes. you're talking and i'm thinking like okay the infantry is not going anywhere because at the end of the day yeah. you still have to kick in a door and then i think oh man that would be creepy if, yeah like as an infantryman like Mm -hmm. in an urban situation you're getting hunted by these swarms of little fucking bomb drones yeah you could that that are entering like yeah trying to enter in the house like one goes blows the door the Mm -hmm. other one goes in looks for people blows like yeah or whatever right exactly yeah shotgun shell shots like something like that yeah yeah or but, and, and that could be, mm-hmm. you know, just be, and, and I thought about like uh, the LIDAR you did. Yes. Like Magco Lab, just going in and doing that. Mm-hmm. Like you could have one drone do that. Yes. And then the other one is directing and, the rest. And that drone exists already mm-hmm. too. The, um, so uh, it was uh, Brink. Brink, uh, they sell dro- drones for law enforcement. Yeah, um, Brink's. Brink's home Brink okay yeah, it's, it's just called Brink oh, okay. like Brink drones or something like that I, I gotta check out their actual company name but uh, they they have one drone initial the first one that came out that was supposed to be a drone built for SWAT like an FPV drone built for SWAT and so it had a little like glass cutter on there too so like you would fly it up to a window and bash the glass and so you could actually had an entry and you could literally like just throw the drone inside of the building um, it, you could flip it, it'll flip itself over and then you could fly and navigate inside of the building. Um, well now the new one has like thermal night vision, uh, optical. I think it has like a laser range finder. Um, it has the, um, same, you know, build quality. Like you could chuck it, you could throw it in a backpack. You can put it through a window. It can take a little bit of a beating and still keep operating. Um, but it has some it has lidar obstacle avoidance so you can actually like move around an area but the other big thing about it is that it has real-time lidar mapping so you could actually throw it into a building map out the building and now you have the floor plan and then you could do whatever operations you have from there but that's built for swat i would not be surprised if the smaller lidar gets which actually it's pretty small in some instances that you could just retrofit it onto a loiter munition and now it's able to find its way around um because there has been a lot of advancements in machine learning and that's the other scary part is if you can find a loiter munition with machine learning algorithms 
you could essentially just send a dummy bomb that has a print of what an enemy is supposed to look like and it'll just hunt that and you don't even, you're not even in control of it anymore you're just like fly see you later bye go go find some people mm-hmm. which i could see some i could see some um how do i put it i could see some like Geneva Convention, like landmines or chemical warfare stuff coming up from that. Like if you're not in control of the munition, do you really know if it's hunting that? Because machines aren't perfect. They're going to hunt whatever, but if it's close to that, like it could be an American soldier. It could be a child, which would be horrible. But that's also why we had the Geneva Convention, because that's what chemical warfare and mines were doing. So if you have to have control over it, which would probably be the more ethical way to do war, um, which is really nothing ethical about war, but that's more ethical than leaving your munitions behind to hurt somebody else later on down the line. Um, but yeah, so it's like that, that's where I think it would be really spooky, especially with infantry is like, if you could have these essentially like drones going through buildings, yeah, I mean, think yeah. about breaking glass. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm, like, I'm just thinking like, of like, Oh, blow door. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it, that would be great. Like, I, I think especially if we're a, if we are able to take advantage of that, like one of the things is like, you know, infantry, if you're going kicking down doors, you always chuck a grenade in or you at least try mm-hmm. to chuck a grenade into that first yeah. room. You know, it's hot, yeah. clear it, enter it. Um, but you could do that from afar now with like, uh, cause I know you, I mean, we have airburst rounds for like the M the M two Oh three, or it's now the M three twenty uh, grenade launcher systems. And then there are, I believe we're supposed to be adopting the Carl Gustav for stuff like that, which would be amazing if we could get the Carl Gustav. Um, What's the Carl Gustav? So it's a recoilless rocket launcher. Oh yes, I saw my yeah those yes. yeah, those. I was like, man, that sounds familiar. Yeah. Like, I don't wanna just okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, now what, those are freaking cool because yeah. you, unlike the AT4 behind you, is fire mm-hmm. and forget. Those are they mm-hmm. open the back and then you can stick in another one. And yes, you can continue to fire. Yes, and you just keep throwing rounds in there. And they're um, what was it? It's making a resurgence in the battlefield, mostly because it's it's not actually really good as an anti tank round anymore, just because tanks are so big and bulky. Unless it's a Russian tank, you can take anything down with that. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> yeah, apparently. Uh, yeah, and it's but. They're great for anti-personnel and light armor. Great for anti-personnel and light armor. So that's what they've really been using it for is like, oh, do you need to penetrate a building with that? Yeah, you can put like a double explosive munition on there, blow through the first part of the building and then blow up inside of the building or something like that. And like you could you could do all sorts of stuff with a Carl Gustav. And then, if you know, you can make a specific infantry based team for that, give a whole team a whole set of different rounds like go out there and just cause absolute mayhem and it's super light to carry around it's not really big and long like this guy because this guy kind of long and Mm -hmm. i think the carl gustav is a little shorter the carl gustav is yeah yeah it's like the cadillac of no it's better than cadillac yeah it's like you know something good it's definitely yeah and it's got you could put better sights on it everything's good about it i love it Though I wish we did, actually, we still are fielding law rocket launchers too, but mm-hmm. I think they're only for like special forces or something like mm-hmm. that. I think. I don't know if the, does the infantry actually we have still use? We had in Afghanistan, they brought back the 60, the law. Yeah. Which is interesting. They got rid of the law because of Vietnam. Yeah. Uh, because the North Vietnamese would turn them into mortars yeah oof. and because they're a 60 millimeter rocket and so you can <laughs> shoot a 60 millimeter mortar oh yeah and then america's answer was eh, quit producing laws make at4 which is an 84 millimeter it's the same which is <laughs> so which is fire and forget but it's an 84 millimeter so the russian 82 uh, mortar round can't be fired from it. Oh my! In some sort of hasty way. Yeah. But now it's all changing. Now, yeah. now it's like I think about how frightening, um, urban like just uh, mil- urban clearing and uh, is. Oh yeah. And how how that's gonna change how that's going to change the battlefield because I could see a squad getting just spending more time in one place Mm -hmm. to fly a drone 
just for some warm and fuzzy. And yeah. while they're sitting there flying a drone, they might be located by somebody else. Who's yeah. Like, oh, well, let's just blow them up because they don't want to move because they aren't moving quick enough. Yeah. And so I wonder <laughs> how much of a cat and mouse it's going to turn uh, yeah. in, in the future. And that because... And the fact is, if we're talking about this, you know that people in the Pentagon oh, yeah. are very serious oh, talking yeah. about this. 100%. If not, they're like, no, we're already ahead of you. We've already developed some well, for it. So, like, fun fact, going back to more of the um, sort of more of the enterprise, like drones for good sector, mm-hmm. um, not the drones for warfare sector. Because, I, I mean, I think drones are great. Yeah. I don't want to make anybody scared. They do a lot of great stuff more than they do a lot of bad stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, warfare is scary. And I just, in general though, this is just an interesting advancement, but the amount of good that they do is significantly more. However, the, um, when the military first initially was like, Hey, we don't want to use DJI because they're a Chinese company. Right. Um, they wanted to build something called the blue UAS list. Uh, for the DOD, and they made a a version one and version two, and then subsequently that whoever manned that whole program that got disbanded. So there's a bunch of companies who were trying to get on the blue list because the feds are fucking lazy, mm-hmm. and they really want to use the blue list because oh the the blue list is security cleared, and it's like there's a difference between DOD cleared, made for warfare, and NDAA compliant, which is what you need for ninety percent of your jobs, but the feds are lazy. If they see that they can go ahead and just take from the military sector just to say it's secure, they're going to do that. So there's like a big issue that we have with the enterprise sector is that there's tons of U.S. companies that want to be able to help get with federal like clients or just even people who are not federal look at the blue U.S. list and say, well, the feds say they want it, so I want it. And it's like, no, 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 you don't need that. You're managing like a field in the middle of nowhere. Why do you need a blue drone? like a blue clear drone they, you don't it's a misunderstanding and it's really pervasive so a blue clear drone is a drone that's cleared uh, for is security cleared electronic wise for dod operations and for oh. the dod to purchase oh gotcha. yes oh, and so understand. that's that's the concept right gotcha. um the feds are just they can make their own list if they want to which they really should um, but they're lazy, uh, and the DOD already did most of the work for them, and so they're like, no, we're, we're going to just use the blue list, which is horrible because they're warfare drones. They're not really enterprise drones. Fun fact, they've been shipping these blue drones to Ukraine. Most of them are not getting used because they cannot be used very well for warfare. Hmm. They just, they're just not good at it. Um, too many of the drones require too much extensive training, they're exorbitantly expensive. Um, like, uh, for for instance, and it's because of the it's because of the security stamping and the security testing that they've had to do, which has made them so expensive. Um, a free fly Alta X it lifts like like thirty pounds. Um, civilian cleared. Like, if I just wanted to go and purchase one, is twelve thousand dollars, which is already pretty expensive for a blue stamp. $44,000 just because it's been security cleared. So imagine another country trying to buy a $44,000 drone when they could just buy the $12,000 version or they can go buy a DJI or Altel for 1000 bucks or less than that if they want to make their own loiter munitions. Like the mo and, and the other part too is most of the US companies have their own like proprietary control system, proprietary flight system. So you have to relearn that drone, relearn the other one. Whereas most of the drones they're using over in Ukraine, they all have same control schemes, which means anybody can pick up the drone and go fly it. You could say, Hey, private Snuffy, this plays like a video game. Go play. Whereas a lot of the companies here are like, Well, I just wanna it just has to be this way. Because it's like, then they get to teach a course and have more follow-on training and make more money. Bingo, bingo, content. bingo, bingo. So, and that's that. Yeah. But that also means that they are actually considering how the way the war in Ukraine is going. Um, they're just poor warfare drones. So we have a blue list that is no good as a blue list. It's just security posturing, which is horrible. 
<laughs> so, um, and, and that's just something that as the drone industry has just been combating is like the blue list is more of a commercial aspect anyways. And it's just so that way the feds can posture on a posture on security and essentially say, well, we're not, we're not in bed with China when let's face it, China probably makes some of the best drones on the market. They just do. Um, there was another drone company that I got to do a test with that actually they sell more than just drones. It's drones, a couple drones, like two drones, a bunch of LIDAR systems and all that other stuff. And holy cow, that drone that they have flies better than some of the American drones I've gotten my hands on. And I'm like, how is that? Like, come on. How is this hard for us to do? And they're just doing it. Like some of the things I look at is like in flight characteristics. If you have like an automated flight mission for mapping, um, you want to have nice, easy turning through waypoints. So, like, if it comes to like a like a corner, right, in your um, in the sky waypoint mission, right, or your not your waypoint, but like your automated flight mission, there's a lot of times where even I've had like my hotel will go forward, stop, and then turn, and then stop, and then turn again, and then go for the next line um, to take more photogrammetry shots. Whereas this one, uh, and DJI's do this too, um, when you go to fly it'll actually do this nice clean sweep around so that way it's not jerking the sensor and creating false positives for certain data, especially for LiDAR data. You don't want to stop. You want to keep a nice smooth motion with the way you're flying. And I'm like, that's hard for most companies to do. And I don't understand that (laughs) smooth, smooth turn flights, um, really easy waypoint missions. The fact that calibration for the LiDAR system was already built into the drone, which I don't know why that's not common practice. Um, it's starting to, it's starting to, um, but it's not common practice for, for most, for most sensor systems. And I think a lot of it is also, it's a rough market trying to get into it and trying to sell it to people. And then also trying to develop for it because it's very, very technically, um, what is it? Very, just a very technical thing. It's not necessarily easy to do. We think it is because we're the end users, but it's not as easy to do as it seems. But it is baffling that China has gotten this weird leg up out of nowhere. Oh, it seems like this weird leg up. Um, and we're still kind of left into the dust with it because we're the ones who like pioneered the use of drones, really, like is with the predator systems and everything like that. Go back to military stuff. And I'm surprised we haven't taken it anywhere. Like <laughs> we, we, we had the technology and somebody else was like, let's turn this into a commodity. And it just worked. So it, it's interesting. It's interesting how geopolitics goes and how in the end of the day, it really didn't benefit anybody to have weird geopolitics, you know, comes to drones, consumerism, and then even just using it for warfare and everything. It just did. None of it worked. We're like back to square one, but now with way too many rules that don't make sense. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. It makes me think about, it looks like that drone technology was so disruptive. That yeah. It, that policy just doesn't know how to adapt to it. No. And I think about, I watched this thing about how all these countries were sending all these fancy big drones to Ukraine. And then I think about what you said, like, oh, they're dead in the water. Yep. Because nobody wants to learn how to use it uh-huh. or learn how to fly it or they just aren't even tested for combat yeah. to begin with. Well, and that's like, th- that's a big thing. Something I, I, I definitely preach on is like, um, and actually some people in the industry are preaching it is like pro- uh, product parity. You need to parity what your consu- what what your competitors are doing. Like if they're doing something that works, if you can skirt around the copyright or just get close enough to it, like that you, you really should be pushing for that because the easy transfer from one to another, like um if any any consumer, like you you don't have a car with a different like piloting scheme on it, right? Or a different driving scheme on it. All cars function about the same. All cars' engines function about the same, unless it's an electric car, but that's a little bit different right now. Um, But if you're a mechanic, you're going to kind of know how to fix that, or you're going to, just a person driving it, you're going to know how to drive it. If somebody came up with a new car with a different, different, like, hey, you got to pull this lever and then, like, 
turn this weird wheel that's on your left hand side and then you got to take these two pedals and like push them back and forth to make the car go forward like it's a really intuitive control scheme nobody's gonna buy it because it's not familiar like <laughs> and that's the thing is it's like even in the like like training joe in the army you want to have something that works the same something that's easy for them to get on and something that you could break it down Barney style. Like this works the same as your video game. Play it like your video game. It's why the grenade shaped like a baseball. Exactly. Exactly. It's why the grenade is shaped like a baseball. Cause <laughs> all you know is, Oh, Hey, I, th- I throw it. You pull one pin, technically two, you pull, mm-hmm. you take the safety Double lever, flip. take the, that, and then you throw it. I mean, you could cook it too, but you mm-hmm. still, the way that it works is that exactly that way. If every every good American knows how to throw a baseball, you're going to know how to throw a grenade. It's the mm-hmm. same thing. So it's that that's a lot how and, and even then too like a lot of our training systems too are that way now. Like um one of the ones that they have for like urban clearing is this like computer system that uh essentially plays it's it's um not squad uh, Arma. It's like a version of Arma or something like that. And it plays just like Battlefield. Like, <laughs> mm-hmm. it's just got an ability to call for fire in there and stuff like that. And it's like, we have that. And it's like, everything is built very, um, very samey, very easy to use. Um, very much like, um, uh, what was it? It's like everything's built to a third or fifth grade level because it's very easy for an adult to pick up on. Um, and, just put it into action like that's how all our doctrine is written Mm -hmm. um and that is how a lot of our operations are done shoot like this this thing that has the instructions on it yeah 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 it it has the instruct the at4 has got the instructions Mm -hmm. right on it and it's Mm -hmm. like that's that's why like Mm -hmm. we need it to be as easy and fast as possible but if you make this complicated control scheme uh a complicated interface a complicated way to make the drone work a uh a complicated like you like you have to go through a a two week course just to go and fly this giant thing like that, that that's how the raven is it's a two week course but i can tell you right now i can't put that raven into joe's hands and say yeah go fly it out there you know if you're trying to get loiter munitions out and stuff like that the faster that somebody can just put a drone in their hands or put equipment in their hands and go and use it effectively that's what's that's what's going to win the war that's what everybody is going to push towards Mm -hmm. that's just how it is and it's not even warfare that's anything in life that is anything any product any service if you can make it easier for somebody to use that they will navigate towards that Mm -hmm. um to kind of go off of uh what was it to go off of drones for a second and going back to like um surveying and stuff like that which is a total pivot almost um gps receivers like high grade construction or survey gps receivers um there's a lot of them that are very complicated to use out there like your trimbles and your Leicas and stuff like that but there are also much easier units you can see a lot of people pick up these these ones called emolids not only they're cheaper but you use like your android phone to interact with them and get the data and all that other stuff. Whereas the other ones you're using like a $10,000 data collector just to try to do all your calculations on it. And it's like, why, why? Like Mm -hmm. this works so much better. Why, why would I want to use this data collector when I could use like an Android device to simply interface with the same thing. And it is showing like, there's a lot of people moving towards Android based GPS receivers and they're cheaper, more effective. They're just as accurate, if not more accurate than what has typically been the gold standard. Um, and a lot of it's just old companies not wanting to change. Mm-hmm. They're like, well, this is how it, it's always been. Well, newsflash, that's not how things always have to be. Mm-hmm. And they definitely will change without you if you don't choose to change with it. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, the technology users are very resistant to changing technology mm-hmm. and having to relearn something because then that, that, hurts and it's frustrating Mm -hmm. to try to figure out a new app or whatever yeah if you can make it as seamless for the end user as possible it's going to get adopted and used really quickly and even if it's a very complicated piece of equipment like a gps receiver like it doesn't sound complicated but when you're trying to get into like surveying and elevation and all sorts of other stuff like 
I have to do a small portion of that just for making sure that my drone data is correct uh, for my customer. Uh, but even just that amount, it's like, okay, there's a lot that needs to be learned. Um, but the fact that I have an, a receiver that can just make it easy for me to interface with it and work it, it's made the process easier for something that is complicated. And it's easier for me to understand and want to get more into the complexities just because it's easier to interface with. Like that's, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's the night and day difference. Like you can make it complicated. It's just make it easy for me to want to get into it. Don't make it like the bar to entry is I have to go and take a, a 20 year college degree or whatever, just mm -hmm. to try to get into this thing, you know, uh, that would be sucky for a 20 year college degree. That would be horrible. Yeah. <laughs> Gosh, yeah. dang no, it. I understand like anything yeah. that requires a lot of training and then you're going to get those people that put all this time in training and then they're going to see somebody else just come and blow them out of the water with. Yeah. And they're like, what the hell is that? That's bullshit. You shouldn't be using that. Oh yeah. Yeah. I bet they say that. Story. Oh, they do. They do. It's, it's very much a, uh, a like, I guess you could say like, it's like a sunk cost fallacy. Yeah, you put all the cost. So you put a lot of time mm -hmm. effort into this one thing that you're like, Oh man, I'm really good at this now. And then somebody else comes along and it's like, Hey, we did the same thing, but it's easy for every, anybody to use. And it's like, well, you can't do that. And it's like, no, they can. I'm sorry that you spent all this time doing this, but you kind of, <laughs> you, 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 you lost out on a better way, you know? And mm -hmm. it, it just is that it's just a better way. And it does the same exact thing that you just did. So it's either you get mad about it or you recognize it and you go do better. And that is the risk of being in a career of tech. Yes. Because your job could be disappeared. Oh, the yeah. Next, the next day. Next yeah. Five years. And next. Yeah. Next day. Next five years. It's like, uh, you know, that's something else, too, is like um, I get worried, too, about sometimes when they do new drone releases because I was like because I always think, is the drone I just bought going to somehow be outmoded? in mm -hmm. a year or something like that mm -hmm. and sometimes yeah it's like uh actually that's something i'm a little bit little bit um peeved about with autel um and i i get why they did it but like their autel evo series they have three different versions all with different chipsets and only their third version do they have like all of their features and everything unlocked which i get but like they took they had a version one then they took features away on the version two and then after the version two, they added a bunch of new features back to the version three. And they're like, yeah, this is the one we're going to stick with. And I'm like, what about version one and two? Are we still getting support? Are we still getting like updates for remote ID or whatever? And it's like, <sighs> they kind of just threw their arms in the air and was like, nope, I don't know. Maybe I've never seen a lot of official responses from them. So it's like, cool. So us customers who just bought this thing, we're now realizing is a brick or close to being a brick, maybe still usable. At least now that remote ID has been pushed out six months, we can still use those things, but it's like, cool. Thanks guys. Like you're not supporting the thing that you said you would, you would support and you only had it out for like a year. Cool. <laughs> that sucks. Yeah. But that's, that's always, always kind of a worry too. It's like, um, if there's new drone releases, usually companies will just drop the previous model entirely mm -hmm. um, within the next like couple of months or something. And I, I see that's getting better, though. There's a lot of companies that are actually trying to keep the support for it, too, and keep accessories and whatnot, because people still use these things for a long amount of time. Um, shoot, people have been sticking with like the Phantom 4 Pro for mapping for, shoot, ever since it came out, like I think, I think it came out like two, three years ago. Which is in a, doesn't sound like a lot, but in drone terms, like people are using these on a daily basis. And I think the model itself came out like six years ago. I'd have to check. Um, but yeah, like that, that drone has been around for so long for like land surveyors and engineers and stuff like that. And they're still using it. And there's still some people who are really clinging on to that drone. Um, but they're, they're starting to see their age. And so there's a lot of used models out there where they're like, yeah, so like the camera won't go straight anymore. Mm -hmm. um, the camera like won't focus. The camera won't, you know, the gimbal flips around and broke itself because it just, it aired out. Um, so like they're, they're definitely at the end of life, but people use the crud out of those things until they're just absolutely gone. Um, but same thing, larger drones, like bigger enterprise drones, they're made to last for years. 
Um, so it's always nerve wracking when a new one comes out and you're like, but I'm going to have this thing for like the next couple of years. What? <laughs> you just came out with something new. I really hope you're going to support it. So hmm. yeah. And it's just such an influx industry. Um, there's good stuff, there's bad stuff, but you really got to do your, re- your research on it because there's uh, there's definitely some drone companies where I've looked at them and I'm like, I have no idea what you made this for. Like, I don't know why you, like, cool, you made a drone, but I have no idea what market you're going for. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, because your drone doesn't, like, your line of drones don't really do anything. Um, and I don't see who they're made for. It's like you made up your own numbers and said, oh, that's good. And it's like, those aren't the numbers anybody else is working with, so... What if I wanted to do LIDAR for underground cave? Like, how would yeah. I do that? Um, if on, you were to be from the surface. From the surface. So, let's see. There's a couple of drones that are capable of doing that. So, like, I would say the Elios 3 is probably going to be the best one for that. Uh, just because it's got, like, a roll cage. It's got lights on it. Um, it has a LIDAR puck that it also uses for navigation. Um, and that thing's been used in like, like, um, nuclear facilities, like in hot zones of nuclear facilities. Mm -hmm. I was hearing at the, at the expo one day that, um, one of the guys, they took an Elios three and they like went into one of the hot zones or like, you know, where they had like nuclear waste and stuff like that. And the drone just kind of like it hit something and then the motor started cutting out because it got too much radiation Mm -hmm. and like it's sitting in like a nuclear bunker to this day. Um, but like, like they they use that thing for all sorts of stuff. And so the, the Elios models probably would be the best for that. Cause it'll, it's, I believe it's like water resistant too, or if not waterproof, um, definitely can't fly in water, of course, but like you, you could throw it into really nasty environments and it'll just take it. Um, but yeah, you like, you would, if you wanted to do mine, that would probably be the one, if not, maybe the only one that I would recommend for that. Um, you could you could use a uh, uh, flyability. Oh no, that's flyability does the Elios. What was the other one? Emerson. Emerson has the hover map, and the hover map's supposed to lock into like an M three hundred, and use the lidar system to not only map the area real time, but also use the lidar as obstacle avoidance. Um, I wouldn't recommend it just because one, you're throwing a giant drone into a cave. I would re- always recommend something smaller that isn't going to damage the propellers. So it can um, still maintain mm-hmm. frequency. Yes, it can. That's pretty impressive. Yeah, and you can you can get like repeaters inside the cave too. So like you could drop a repeater down into a hole, um, you know, with a you know some kind of power attachment, and then you could re- you use like a patch repeater inside of the hole. Interesting. Um, Drones with repeaters. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm learning new things. Yeah, that I know about. it's just a radio frequency. All you're doing is huh. bouncing it from one to another, and then right to the drone. So it's it's just a network. Um, so it's it, there, there's lots of ways to be able to function with that. Um, the only problem I've heard about some of the Emerson stuff is that the um, the hovermans have a tendency to sometimes not work correctly on the obstacle avoidance because they're using one sensor for data collection and obstacle avoidance. Um, and that doesn't bode well for redundancy. And so the problem is, is a lot of times the drone will just crash to a wall, um, mm-hmm. which means now the LIDAR system and the drone are are down, which in that's no cave. in a cave that you may not be able to get it back yeah. from. I mean, that, that can happen to the Elios also, but the Elios is like this big, whereas the Emerson one would be like, you're on a drone like this big mm. and trying to th- throw that thing down a cave. Like as far as my w- arms are out wide is like, you know, it would be a, a, for the big drone. It would be a yard cubed. Whereas the Emerson is like a foot cube. So it's, there's, there's a, there's a huge size difference and just volume difference for what you're doing. And then the, the Emerson has a roll cage that you could push against a wall or sorry, not the Emerson, the, um, the Elios, has a roll cage that you can push up against the wall and you could like roll the drone along the wall too. So like you can keep flying while you're pushed up against something. So you, you have a lot of control. You can use the environment to like roll, roll this thing down, you know, a little aisle way or something like that. And you push it up against something. Whereas the big drone, you can't do that. If you hit like a, uh, like a stalactite or stalagmite or something mm-hmm. like that, you're done. It's going to hit your propeller and then you're, you're off to the, you're off to the races of, trying to find that thing in the cave um the only other way there is the leica unit but i know the leica units using the blk on there and i 
don't know if I would recommend that one. That's not really a really good unit so comparatively. So there are drums if I want. So that's, yeah, yeah. I answered the question. So yeah. I could go, that's really cool. Yeah. And, and I didn't even these, think of these concepts of the repeater. Yes. A cage that protects it. Mm-hmm. So you can really beat it up and f- try to throw it into some stuff. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. And then they've got, um, I, there's more, the one, first one that I saw, and this is actually for pipe uh, pipe inspection. and could be used for other things too. Uh, the Sky Gauge drone, which is the one that I saw originally commercial and pioneer the idea of it, is a it has a unique propulsion system where... Normally, whenever you have the drone with like the the quad, you know, the setup, mm-hmm. those propellers are fixed. As soon as you push the drone forward, you know, that drone is going to go forward kind of like a helicopter. You know, it's going to go whichever way you've powered those propellers. Um, whereas the sky gauge actually has it to where the, the propellers are on an axis. So you can move the body, but the drone won't go in any other direction. It'll stay fixed. So you can move the body up and down, and the idea is That's it's got cool. this. Yeah, you can get yeah, crap. Yeah, you can get get you can kind of kind of move it at different angles, um, and the idea is that you use it for testing of like steel pipes in a um, in like a manufacturing facility. So it's like a little sonar detector that you would push up against a pipe uh, and detect how thick that pipe is. Oh, I just mm-hmm. hit that, um, and you detect how thick that pipe is, uh, so that way you can tell if the pipe needs to have maintenance or not and that would normally take maybe even months to be able to do on a manufacturing facility because you'd have to put scaffolding up and everything or you take the drone and you just go boop and then you go to the next one and keep going yeah like yeah it's possibilities are endless so it makes me think about so you have your your company that Mm -hmm. started aero scout or scout aerial Scout yeah. Aerial, yeah. Sorry. It's okay. Um, and how, what, what is it? What is the deliverable mm-hmm. that you give to a, a and, and what is your capabilities and what are your deliverables? So the capabilities right now, so the, the end goal end state and primary kind of industry is the construction industry as the whole, uh, like looking at like land surveyors, engineers, uh, uh, general contractors and uh, asset asset holders to be able to um, get eyes on their 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 um, their projects and keep and help manage those projects and either to be able to do like pre-construction like helping out the land surveyors with a topography survey um, or being able to help them with altas and boundaries helping the engineers with being able to get um structures uh built or being able to get like a scan to bim model as is conditions and then helping like general contractors being able to keep eyes on target and essentially doing data culmination so it's the same thing as like in my opinion because i come from the recon side of the military and it's all kind of just adapted recon it's how are you able to pull information in from that job site so that way everybody has eyes on target and then you're able to turn that into actionable uh actionable Um, steps, if you will, in order to be able to help do better on that project. So some of the deliverables, it would be like, if it's for like a land surveyor, you're looking for like DTMs, DSMs, which are digital terrain models, digital surface models, Um, your uh, tin models, topos. um, You can kind of do some, some Alta stuff with that. So I have some basic alt, like Alta capabilities, mostly to help with the surveyor with some of the line work that they have. Um, for the engineers that would be providing scanning and providing the point clouds. Um, so that way they could do scan to BIM or do, uh, clash detection capabilities. Um, and I do have some limited CAD capabilities like for 2d CAD, because there's a lot of guys in the area that are still doing 2d, like they can't operate in 3d. It's just way too complex. Um, and so I have the ability to take that that three-dimensional object and turn it into a two-dimensional object and then CAD that model out or just provide the the PDF for them to use in whatever software that they have, Uh, PDF or um, drawing file or whatever it is that they need. Um, And then for like general contractors, I actually have been using uh, drone deploy 
uh, mostly because it's a great place to put all of your photogrammetry data and process all that and great for being able to share out with other people. So they'll get a, a cloud or sorry, a, um, a live cloud to be able to actually see, view their job site, have all this data culmination. Um, and then through that project, I'll put all of the data from that. So any 360 walkthroughs, uh, videos, photos, um, if they have any um, plans, I'll take their plans and I'll uh, eliminate borders from that and culminate all their plans into one area. Uh, so that way they could see where everything has lied inside of that project and then how their plans are actually progressing with that project. And then you could do constant construction mapping, provide uh, geo TIFF files so that way they always have something that's geo rectified. Um, but they also have a, uh, this image that they're able to then pull information from later on down the line. Um, and some of the stuff that I'm really wanting to get more into is being able to do things like point cloud classification uh, for um, being able to do more like tree, tree counting and segmentation, utility counting and segmentation, um, and to pull out features and stuff like that from the point clouds too. Um, some of the other stuff though, like even with the, with the laser scanning and the, um, laser scanning and the photogrammetry also help a lot too, with like being able to do volumetric surveys or, um, just being able to do cut fill assessment of a whole project. So you can see how much dirt they've taken away or put into a project, but also being able to do that with the survey markers that have been put onto the project. Cause that's how it should be done correctly <laughs> is being able to tie into whatever survey that they have there because otherwise it's you could the big stipulation is you could fly it like anybody can fly a drone mission and it's like yeah cool anybody can fly it but is it correct and that's a whole nother level of being able to do it is like being able to tie into your survey marks being able to show that it is actually like you have proper overlaps with photogrammetry or you have a lidar system that's accurate enough to be able to measure a lot of that stuff and then help pull features out to get accurate surveys of an area so it some of it is kind of amalgus because it helps with lots of different functions and some of the functions uh like being able to do um utility tracking and spotting for a project for safety measures is something that a lot of a lot of assets holders or even general contractors haven't really used that for. So it would be in that example would be flying over a project that's going to do uh, road construction or they're doing utility construction or they're putting a new building in over existing areas. If you have the locators that have put the locate marks on the ground, you essentially do photogrammetry over the top of them and then you can get centimeter level precision to refine where those locate marks are at. Now, somebody would say, hey, I could just recall the locators to get out there. But one, the locators are way backed up on anything that they're doing. There's so many, so much, we have a shortage of locators in, in Spokane. Um, and we also just don't have enough people that have the locating. Locators. locators are the guys who go out and they locate gas, power, water, sewer. Surveys. Uh, yeah, it, no, different, a no. little different. So they're, they're, they're a locating company um, that is specifically geared towards um, like, you've got your road construction projects and stuff like that. And all they do is they come out with a little locate box and they'll hook up to like a wire and then they'll locate where the, the, the line is relatively in the ground within two feet either side. And then they'll spray a mark right down there. And that's how you find kind of the general area idea of where your locates at, but they're typically not surveyors. They're typically guys that are just hired off the street to do this. Mm -hmm. So um, if you're a locator out there, I definitely respect you for being able to, to, deal with the companies that are out there. Um, but surveyors will kind of do that too, but not, not a lot of them really do that in the area. Cause it's kind of, kind of a pain in the butt to be able to do, especially with these larger locate companies. Um, but the being able to, being able to go over an area and do photogrammetry on that one creates audit data. So, it creates audit data for if areas were missed by the contractor, if areas were missed by the locator, if a utility was hit and you actually knew the location or if the location was off or not captured or whatever. Um, but it also creates a great way for you to be able to refine that locate in a relative aspect with a GPS receiver, like a, like a low, um, a, like an AMOLED, which is like 2,200 bucks per, per like GPS receiver, which, Sounds like a lot to us, 
But for a contracting company that's usually dealing with companies like like Leica or Trimble that are asking twenty five, thirty thousand dollars for a GPS receiver, just one, like that's a, that's a significant savings. Um, but being able to essentially then with the photogrammetry to get your centimeter level uh, GPS points on whatever marks the locators have made. So if it rains, if it snows, if cars have wiped out the the utility marks, if you've put dirt on it, if you've put a plate on there, you could technically refine it. And it's really great to be able to use for walkthroughs in the very beginning for a crew. Because again, you using drone deploy, it'll hook up to your phone. Or like you give the share link to somebody, you look at it on your phone, um, anybody can look at it on their phone and it hooks up to your GPS on your phone. So you could do a job site walk and be like, okay, cool. This is where the locates were 30 days ago. They're still there trapped digitally. So you never lose them. Um, and then you're always able to come back to them for the remainder of that project. So it's not a, an excuse to never call the locators because you do by law have to call them after a certain amount of time. Uh, but it's a great way for you to be able to have that extra layer of data security because there's been so many times I did utility installation for eight years. There were so many times that if we had that capability, we would have never hit anything. Like, <laughs> Or even if we did hit something, we would know for 100% fact that when we call the locators in at that point in time, either A, it wasn't marked or it was done incorrectly, or maybe we marked the area incorrectly and we're actually out of like our dig radius. So... That would, that would save a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of lives, too. Because if you're hitting power, <laughs> that's, that's no bueno. That's no bueno. Um, but that, those are some of the products and capabilities that I offer. Um, and again, it's a little bit of malgus because sometimes it's, uh, it's kind of just, well, what kind of mixed bag do you want to do? Do you want to do a bit of data collection along with maybe a little bit of you know topographic capabilities just so you understand where the level of the ground is? Um, or we're, or are you looking for a full topo survey? In that case, we need to team up with a land surveyor and actually do this correctly. Um, you know, or, you know, do you want to get tree counts because you need to know how many trees are in this area that you need to be able to clear out for pre-construction or something like that? It's, there's a, there's a lot of different ways to capture it because there's more than one thing that geospatial data can pull out of an area. And that's the one part that I love about it is like you use, if you use, a GPS receiver or a total station or something like that, you're looking for one, you're looking for a, a small subset of, of capabilities that you can do with whatever you've collected. And it'll only do whatever you've collected. Whereas geospatial capabilities, if you're able to georectify it um, or georeference that data correctly and accurately and get good capture capability on it, you can pull almost any kind of product you want out of that two-dimensional data, three-dimensional data, and use it for whatever it is that you want. You know, machine control for, uh, for construction equipment, doing volumetric surveys, being able to do overlays. Like, if you do one, you, you've got everything. And that's the, the best part about it. You can pull so much from it. And then the more you capture it, the more data you layer on it, the more data you layer. You know, it's like, uh, back to the recon method, is like, if you have a set of guys on an OP and then you get another set of guys on an OP and you start like layering those data sets between the two, two sets of guys, you know, for sure there's a target there, you know, for sure there's something there. Um, and then the more eyes you get on that, the more you're able to confirm exactly what's going on. And that's the same, same methodology here as being able to confirm with multiple, multiple captures, multiple eyes, multiple sensors. Um, for a construction company and culminating that and then being able to produce different products out of that quickly and rapidly. So that's it's cool. a lot. It's a lot. <laughs> so uh, you're, you're talking about this in my mind. I'm brainstorming. Yeah. Like, like okay, there is an empty lot, mm -hmm. a dirt lot. I was just that one. And there's going to be something constructed on it. Mm -hmm. But nobody really knows except but you could make this happen through all your technology. So, yeah. So you show up to the dirt lot. You run your LiDAR scan. Yep. And you have that scan of the lot. And then you can also get additional scans later in the future. Yep. And then you take these scans and you run it 
to some software system. It seems like there's extensive mm-hmm. software yes. tools that you're going to have to learn too. Yes. And then from that point, that can create a 2 or 3D map, mm-hmm. which you can then uh, essentially use all these models and overlay them on top of each other. Mm-hmm. And then, so my next thought is, and I bet you someone's already done it. Mm-hmm. You put your phone on your face and you look around the construction <laughs> area and you see the 3D model of what of what it's supposed it, yep. to be like. There is the thing. There's the mark. Yeah. Even though it's not, I don't see it, but I know it's there. Mm-hmm. I can see it through the goggles. Yes. On my phone. This is a, a, that's a hundred percent what you're able to do nowadays. Sweet. So like, you're able to do that? Uh, so, I'm not able to do that. I don't have the software for that, mm-hmm. but that a software absolutely exists and mm-hmm. is capable of doing that kind of thing. Um, I have been able to 3D print a site though. Actually, yeah, couple, you got a 3D cu- printer. We haven't yeah, and that, that's a whole other thing. Uh, yeah, and that's something I've done is like, yeah. especially because a lot of a lot of people they they working with brand new like cutting edge technology. It's also cutting edge technology is expensive. I'm, I'm a tiny company, um, but the more customers I get that I'm able to actually charge what I'm you know more of what I'm worth, the more the technology that I can get that I can help facilitate these kind of experiences for them and say, hey, listen, I'll come on site. We'll go use the AR for a little bit, you know, and I've already looked at a couple of different companies on like how to be able to do that. RTAC for one, RTAC's able to do that. Um, but then uh, I think it's like, uh, what was it called? There's another one that's specifically made for AR utilities, AR utilities, and then doing like construction uh, or digital construction reconstruction using like cell phone data. Cause that's the other cool part. It's not just with drones. You can use camera data, like, phones, big, big cameras, stuff like that. Um, handheld LIDAR, you know, terrestrial LIDAR, like all this can be culminated into one project. Um, so let's, let's run through that dirt lot, like as an example, Mm -hmm. right? So like dirt lot, they want to know what's going on with it. Um, get with a contractor and they say, Hey, we need to be able to get this dirt lot going. We're going to pull you in as like the digital collection specialist. Let's go with that. Um, I will be teamed up with the surveyor of their choosing to help them produce a boundary survey, a topo survey, and an Alta. An Alta is like putting a bunch of different lines on the ground to show exactly where everything is is pr- precisely located for CAD models, uh, your line work, if you will. So we'll go ahead and fly, say, fly the LIDAR over top of it so you can get absolute, you know, ground measurements out of that and use a program to identify the the difference between the ground and the grass and the trees and the buildings that are surrounding it and then just get right down to bare earth. Um, Always make sure that you got checks there. And so we'd help use the surveyor, or we would work with the surveyors with whatever marks they put down, maybe put down some additional marks that they have missed um, and just for my own reference, so I know that the data is, you know, prop being properly geo referenced and we're not having weird dips in areas, which usually we don't have to, the surveyors do a fantastic job. Um, fly the LIDAR over it, get ground gate data, check it with the ground control points that we've marked, um, and then help them with some of the line out data. And then they could also use that for the boundary survey because now everything is properly aligned. Once those products have been, you know, given off to the surveyor and then given back to the uh, the contractor, then we can then work with the engineer and say, hey, so here's that LIDAR data that we did. And then here's the photogrammetry data. You can put this in and use this with your BIM model. So now the BIM model, they can use all of that data to help scan to BIM, uh, figure out where the building's at, what their cut and fill is supposed to be. Um, and then once they know how much cut and fill has to be there, or I can help them facilitate how much cut and fill they need to have, um, you know, taking out the amount of dirt there, then that goes to the construction processes. And as soon as they start doing construction, you keep flying it, keep monitoring it. And you can actually see from that monitoring progress. Um, okay. They've cut some dirt out. You can then compare that back to their dirt model and say, okay, how far down have you gone? Have you gone a decent amount of way down can then compare the plans. If the plans are, 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 put on survey mark and they're absolutely accurate, you can detect deviation in those plans and deviation in the in the uh, the building information model, which is the BIM model. It's like a 3D model that's technically considered the perfect model. Mm, um, the, BIM for model. the BIM model, yeah, which is kind of, it's like saying ATM machine. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, um, but yeah, so then that BIM model, you compare that with the BIM model 
Um, and then you use the point cloud capabilities to then detect clash or clash detection on that BIM model, seeing if there's things that are different, out of alignment, not going according to plan. So the- So, so I take it point cloud is is, a, is That's what the LiDAR data collects. So consider the LiDAR data, it, so when it shoots a point, it shoots a laser, it'll hit one point on that ground. And that is part of that point cloud. So the LiDAR data shoots millions of points everywhere. Um, and that is just, it's a, it's a, it's a field of points that help to generate essentially a model, but it's a point cloud because it's all just little points of data. That's all it is. It's points of data to represent an area. Um, so when you visualize that, that's really what you're doing is you're visualizing an area made of single points that's not actually technically a model because a model actually has a geometry and meshing and all that other stuff put into there. Um, whereas a point cloud is just points or for those nerds out there, vertices, they're little vertices, if you will, little tiny points that you can then create your triangles and your mesh and all that other stuff from. Um, so you would compare the point cloud to the BEM model um, to see if that point cloud is in in conflict that's a better way to put it in conflict with some other portion of it like maybe a doorway is off or um your utilities are off or something like that and there's different levels of resolution and stuff like that same with uh photogrammetry and that's also where the other part of it comes in is what tool is going to be best for what portion of the job do you need something that has a smaller level of detail just so you can get a uh a point cloud out that allows you to be able to do general clash detection or you wanted to get something that's absolutely accurate um, that has really good resolution but is going to be high data consumption um, and you're going to be able to see things like the um, what is it like the mechanical electric and plumbing or meep um, and then you'll you would be able to see that in like a medical flooring or something like that before they pour concrete and be able to detect how far down uh, that, uh, that electrical plumbing is, or electrical plumbing, <laughs> the, yeah, the, the electric, the, the, the electric, the, the electric of the plumbing. Yeah. It's, it's, they put the, the electric in the water and it's, you know, you save two pens <laughs> kidding. Um, but yeah, so like you would be able to see where the plumbing's at. You'd be able to see where the sewer's at all before they pour concrete onto the slab or inside of a wall or something like that. Like, uh, actually a, a company I need to contact at some point. Uh, I was going to do unit scans for them of like an apartment building. So you would do a scan before they put all the walls up and then you do a scan after they put all the walls up and you merge those two point clouds together. And now you know what's inside the walls. Like, <laughs> so you essentially have an x-ray view of everything that's in the walls. And that's part of that data layering throughout a project. You would take all of those bits. So you'd be able to reconstruct and deconstruct that project at any point in time. So whenever that asset holder wants to see something of that project, he can just flip through the files at some point and say, oh, okay, look, th this is where that little bit is at. So instead of having to hire somebody to extensively go through a building and find it, you could just go through the files and be like, right there, that's that pipe we need. Um, but that's the same thing, going through the project. And as they're building that project, you do your 360 walkthroughs, you take photos of areas that are maybe good parts of the project, bad parts of the project, and help report that back and say, hey, this is what I found. Um, this is what's going on with this portion of the project. Here's the, uh, here's the imagery for that. Um, so being able to kind of digitally consolidate all of these visual assets for them that can give them immediate answers of what they need to have happen. Um, focusing on critical information requirements for that. Um, and then as that gets towards the end of the project, then you can do like a final scan of the interior, exterior of the project to make sure A, that everything came according to plan for QA, QC, and B, insurance purposes. So now you have a whole building. This is how it is. This is everything that's that's going to be put there for forever until you decide to make a change for it. So now they have that last scan as like an insurance model. Um, and then after that, you would close out the project and hand all the data into the customer. And if they, they're willing to let you, maybe you keep some of that data so you can use that for training later on down the line. Um, but from that, you can then also build, uh, you know, your 3D models um, to help them with, again, further clash detection, better capabilities on doing like facade inspections and whatnot. And a facade inspection would be like the side of the apartment building. Uh, you're able to actually see every little bit because maybe there's a misalignment in something. So you could detect that and, uh, and, uh, really figure out the, um, if it needs to be fixed or if it's something that's acceptable. 
Um, so there's a lot of, and I'm, I'm skipping over some of this stuff too, cause there's a I'm lot of, a like lot of nitty inspections. Uh -huh. Bridge inspections would be fantastic. Right. Um, and there's uh, bridge inspections combined with AI to do crack detection reports. That's another big thing that's coming mm. up right now. So you'll take as close of like a millimeter level model as possible, which can take some time. Um, but bigger cameras, really easy to capture 3d data. Um, and then you'll combine that with like an AI algorithm and it'll detect every single crack in that bridge. And then it'll give you a, a report spat out and say, this is how broken the bridge is. This is how much it's going to cost to fix it. Like super easy. Like you have that within a week. <laughs> that's impressive. Yeah. And that's, that's some of the stuff eventually that I want to get into because that's, that's where I see a lot of like inspection capabilities going on right now. Cause like right here in Washington, we're still inspecting bridges by sending a guy down, you know, like on a rope or in a, in a basket truck, um, yeah, and doing all of that about how bridge did bridge inspection was a new thing for drones. Yeah. Like, That's just now a new thing. Yes. Like <laughs> yeah. In Washington, it's now a new thing in other parts of the country and overseas. It's not new. Like it's very much like people aren't really going down below bridge as much anymore unless they really have to fix something or they have to get hands on and touch all the bolts and stuff. But if you can send a drone down there and do it, that's the best way to do it because that's the first line of like being able to actually see if something's broken mm -hmm. is getting eyes on and saying, okay, cool. So you get your eyes on. And then finally, when you actually see something's wrong, that's when you get the basket truck out. That's when you go and send your guys down on the line, not to go and look at the concrete and be like, yep, concrete's good again. You know, that's a lot of money you're wasting. Um, but yeah, like back to that dirt lot, like now that's from, from start to finish of like kind of how that goes. And even then there's a lot of little glaze over. Cause if you want to go over that's it's like some of that's drone portion and some of that, a little bit of that was like interior scanning portion. But if you want to go more into interior scans, it's a great way to be able to do like QA, QC. Um, you can do safety audit reports during the middle of the construction progress. Cause doing a walkthrough, you can see if guys have their hard hats off or whatever. Um, and then being able to make sure that everything's just going according to plan, um, making sure that uh, inspections are being done more efficiently because now like a safety inspector or a quality controls inspector can do that all remotely instead of having to go to the site consistently over and over. It's still good if they go to the site. It's always good to get eyes on. Um, but being able to do that remotely means you can blast through some projects a little bit more because you're like, okay, cool, I, you know, I saw that it's captured. It's good. And I gave the okay on this and there's an audit report there. And that's the other thing too, going through audits of your construction sites, <laughs> like being able to have all of that data instead of saying, okay, we got to go and do a walkthrough. You literally just hand the auditor all this data and you're like, look, this is everything we've done. This is how we've done it. These are all the bad. These are all the good. These are the stuff that we've caught ourselves. These, this is the stuff that somebody else caught for us. Um, and it's all captured here in this data. So makes everything super, super nice and easy. And eventually, eventually I'm hoping that this to kind of go into future aspects of things, this is where I'm hoping that digital twinning, like proper digital twinning of maybe construction sites will eventually go from. And so digital twinning, it's used incorrectly as far as a term is, but a true digital twin is when the, um, what is it called? The true digital twin is when a 3d model can also represent live living data. Um, so for instance, in a manufacturing facility, you could do a 3D scan of a manufacturing facility. Um, you give all of the employee remote RFID tags. You have all of your equipment with ID tags on it. So you can see it live in the model. And you also put sensors on every single, like sensor readouts on every single part of your um, manufacturing facility. So you could actually monitor pressures live so everything gets built into this model that actually starts getting live feed information too so you can see when trucks are coming in and out you can see where excuse me you can see when product is being moved in and out and it'll actually do you can use ai to do automatic counts and detections and that gets added to the model and a lot of this already exists today um there's some hospitals over in europe that are using this um airports uh, manufacturing facilities, of course, and some construction sites too, where they're actually monitoring how much material is being taken in and out, who's leaving site and who's idle on site. Um, and who is, uh, like, uh, how far is progress going? If there's a safety issue, is it getting caught? Um, and then the model is renewed every time that a phase of construction is there. So somebody will go in and scan the site 
and then somebody will go and fly the site and then it's redone into the model and it's just like a face that gets masked on top of all that data collection and then everything's reset. Um, so then you've got a new collection set that's going for the next phase of construction or whatever. And so you're able to see live data essentially throughout the lifetime of the project. And so that would probably be better for like super projects, but I can see that becoming mainstream for most of them because then you don't even have to leave an office. You just watch the project get built essentially from, from wherever you're sitting. Um, you can manage multiple projects, almost like they're little sim cities, if you will. Um, and it makes it just super easy, super fast, super quick, super efficient uh, to be able to help, you know, build these projects further and then reduced costs on, on all these projects because you're able to almost, almost micromanage them. You know, you never want to micromanage everything, but almost micromanage at least the data aspect portions of it, which is where 90% of your issues come from. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> no, you, you are very, very informative. Yeah. Person. Wow. Yeah. Um, I, okay. So I, I got a few questions. One, how does the point cloud, when you go to save it to a file, yeah. what is that file labeled as? Like uh, dot JPEG dot what? So what? it's, so there's a couple you can do a, it. So it's dot E 57. It could be either structured or unstructured. Um, you could do a, uh, an LAS, LAZ, an XYZ, or a PLY. Um, those are your typical ones. There's also the RCP file, which is for AutoCAD specifically, um, or Autodesk, Autodesk products specifically. Um, but those are typically like the files you would have from that. And then uh, like your photogrammetry, it'll either be saved as like, you could save it as JPEG, uh, PNG, or preferably... Um, you'll save it as a, um, a GeoTIFF, a GeoTIFF file. And the GeoTIFF file actually preserves all of the, um, the GPS data in there. So it's this gigantic file. It's usually several gigs, more than that. Sometimes it's 30 gigs, 50 gigs, whatever, however big an area you actually collected, whatever sensor you used. The bigger the sensor, the more data that's there. Um, and that will have all the GPS data baked into it and typically a lot of the metadata too um for like elevation and stuff like that so you could click on an area and it'll give you the elevation um and a combination between that um will also give you the dsm which that can be saved as a jpeg a PLY, a geotiff um or sorry a jpeg a png a geotiff or uh i think it's like a dng or or specifically a much more like a what is it called um a dtm It'll be saved as like a DTM file or something like that. Um, I haven't messed a lot with the DTM files, so it's, <laughs> well, it's, it's a whole pushing. other world. Yeah, there, there are so many too. file types and the ways that you work with them, yeah. and those are just some of the some of the things. And then like, uh, so your your meshes will be OBJs or STLs, um, and sometimes they'll have uh, GPS data baked into them. Sometimes they won't. Drone Deploy unfortunately does not do that. That I have that I have seen, but I know uh, some programs will actually do that. They'll bake GPS data into the uh, the file, and then you could just throw it into like Google Earth or something like that. That's pretty cool. Um, but yeah, there's there's a lot of a lot of different file types that you can kick out from that, and that's not even counting all the the sensor systems that you can use with it too. Because I just went over like lidar and photogrammetry, and that's not counting thermal ground penetrating radar, mm -hmm. a bathymetric survey. Um, and then if you had any kind of point data, like, you know, the, uh, the little, the little pinprick thing, there's chemical detectors that you can use too. And then there is, there are, there are programs where there are subsequent like file type capabilities and you can merge all of this data into any GIS system or most GIS systems and have like data culmination between projects and all sorts of other stuff. So, so your personal drones have those capabilities? Some of those, yeah, some, some of those. those. So like the LiDAR and then the photogrammetry, those are the big ones for me. Okay. Yeah. So in that, and the photogrammetry does like 3D modeling, same with the LiDAR, but it's just different, uh, different sensors for different capabilities. So it's like yeah. one's like a truck and the other one's a sedan. So you use them for different things. <laughs> yeah, no, I didn't even yeah. consider there was a, things I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> photogrammetry. Yeah. And, and, and so LiDAR is essentially creating, from what I understand, one... It seems like it's an MRI. Mm -hmm. No, no. So easiest way for me to, to, to kind of disseminate that is uh, LiDAR. 
Just imagine a laser rangefinder. Mm-hmm. Laser rangefinder goes out, hits a point, comes back, tells you how many feet it is away. Mm-hmm. You're the sensor. You know, mm-hmm. you click it and goes boo boo, comes back, right? But that little point for lidar also detects color value. So like reflectance, white has a higher reflectance rate over a darker color, mm-hmm. right? So then you're able to actually see in the point cloud uh, different values for reflectance, which is how you're able to then get definition. Uh, or if you combined it with a camera, then you can get colorization of the point cloud for actual color values. Um, but the way that it works is instead of shooting that one laser, it's shooting like a million lasers a second. Or like uh, the GeoSlam unit that I use does 300,000 lasers a second like 300,000 points. Um, but those lasers aren't going to be as high intensity as like the, the military laser range finders we used uh, that can go out to, you know, 10,000 meters. You've got like 100 meters, 300 meters, depending on the scanner that you have. And so that's you have to get really good with the scanner. What's its reflectance value? What's its, um, how much error does the scanner have? What kind of scanners are there out there? Because there's not just one kind of scanner either. It's... Um, you've got like your terrestrial la- or, or laser scanners, which are on a tripod and they do this little spinny thing. Um, and they pretty much just go out, shoot points, come back. And it says, I'm right here. Kind of like the laser rangefinder. It shoots a point and it comes back and says, oh, I'm this far away. Um, and then you've got your aerial laser scanners, which usually are GPS integrated and you can put them typically on vehicles too. And it'll have a little GPS puck that culminates the data. And so it's taking time of flight with the GPS and then, of course, those point measurements saying, hey, I will move from here to here in an XYZ format, um, took a point and it came back. And so I know I'm at this point in space. So it's doing a little bit more measurement. And then you've got SLAM based LIDAR systems, which is simultaneous localization and mapping. So now the laser scan or the essentially the laser range finder became smart and it knows the objects that it's looking at. So if you have like a table and that's what like I love my geo slam unit um but like if you're walking around it'll say hey this table I've seen this table when I came into the room because that's you know all of these points hit this table um and if I moved from this point to that point I still see the table which means based on my trajectory from where I was to where I see myself going to where this table is at I'm at this point in space so it'll actually map everything to scale based on machine vision, essentially. <laughs> so it's extremely accurate. And I think that one, it's not as accurate as like a terrestrial or the GPS ones, but it's still within like six to 19 millimeters of accuracy, which That's is impressive, which is less than an How inch. How much is that for a slam? <laughs> that for the slam is like 57,000 for that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so which, which brings into another point. Yes. Like, obviously you, I guess one, we yeah. didn't get into how did you get started in this? <laughs> how did you I didn't even go that way, yeah. To to getting into where you are now. It seems like yeah. based off of your techne and the cost of drone like techne is mm-hmm. your technical ability yeah. to do this and your knowledge of the industry. Mm-hmm. It's a pretty high standard barrier to entry. Yeah, it, it, yeah, and to some extent, it's like, how do I put this? It's what I'm going for. What I'm trying to do is base myself as like a collector. So the company is based around collection dissemination, or sorry, collection processing, dissemination, and archival. Um, not necessarily uh, like, oh, I'm going to be the end all, be all. It's I'm there for the professional. So that way they're not having to go out and learn all of this stuff. I just, I'm the facilitator of that. Um, So like a land surveyor, if they're more concerned about doing your boundaries, topos and stuff like that, I can help make their job faster, but they don't have to learn all of the technical crud that goes along with it. Um, But oddly enough, uh, I I went into this much more into a, like a Spartan fashion. Uh, The military is actually what got me involved with it with eventually flying Ravens. Mm -hmm. of all things and they it was like 2019 so it wasn't very long ago um and i went and got the raven course and at the same time i was working natural gas pipeline construction i was like huh i see how we're using this in war but as a scout i also know that i can use this raven to like measure bridges um and get kind of elevations off of buildings and stuff like that and i can pull more from it than just enemy data Mm -hmm. excuse me can i use this for good 
can I use this outside of warfare? Mm -hmm. um, and that's when I started getting kind of interested in it. And that's I started studying about like how drones are starting to be used in construction and all sorts of other stuff. And like they've been used in construction in a lot of areas already by that time. Um, but I was like, hey, I wonder what would happen. Like, let me go buy my first drone and just see what it is. So I bought a DJI Spark. And embarrassingly enough, that Spark has more capability in its little body than the Raven had. Mm -hmm. And that scared me. But I was also like, this is pretty good. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> that means the technology is not like from the 90s, which is where I feel like this freaking drone came from. Uh, because the, the military drone, there was just so much that like it couldn't do that this spark could do. Um, and the fact that it was like little sparks like this big mm -hmm. from DJI, it only flew for like 15 minutes, but it did more than enough. Like if, if that got into the hands of a recon guy, like you could do so much with it just at that point in time, it's even more ludicrous now. Um, but that's when I started looking into it and I was like, can I use this for utilities? And at first it was like, can we use this for utility mapping? Because the way that we're still putting utilities in the ground right now in Spokane is we'd use center line measurements of the road with a wheel. And if you do road construction, the center line changes. So now it doesn't even matter where you measured it from. No, I, I've heard all about it. Like yeah. My sister used to work a land surveying. Yeah. So I'm like, I, I, I hear you talk and I think, how come you haven't got these county like, yeah. contracts yet? And it's, it's just because we're still very old here in Spokane. And it's uh, like, like if you go to like Salt Lake City, Utah, their entire like gas line is measured with GPS. So they know the exact depth, the exact place, exact location. Like their tolerances are um, within a couple of centimeters for exactly where they know where their pipe is. Um, for us, it's like whatever the locator does, which is like within two feet. Which um, is and just the, the guy. Which is just the guy. The but, it's, but sometimes it could be 12 feet off. Sometimes mm -hmm. it could be 21 feet off. Sometimes it could just, nobody knows where it's at. Um, I mean, there's been a couple of times where we're looking for like end of Maine. And which is, you know, just the end of it. And we don't know where it's at. Like it says on the map that it ends here. But it actually ended 50 feet out. And that's scary because what happens if somebody purchased a house and they put a house down there they're like they're digging the gas line that's at the end of the main which actually is pretty easy to seal off so it's not too much of an issue but i mean it's an issue to just hitting it and then not knowing where your facility is at like that's it's un, in my opinion especially in today's day and age it's unacceptable to really not have full eyes on your facility or know and own that facility like you knew it like the back of your hand like they're we should have that. We should have GPS data on all of our facilities, but we don't. Um, I forgot where I was going with this. <laughs> oh, anyway, so yeah, no, it was, can we use drones for for mapping it, for mapping out all of this stuff? Um, and then eventually I got on my deployment, um, came back, and I tried pushing at the company that I was working with again, like, hey, can we use drones to maybe map facilities out and provide better data because our foremen are sitting there scribbling with their hands on maps and then you switch maps with another foreman because maybe you got to do the job later nobody understands each other's lingo uh because everybody's using different symbology and everything like that and i'm like so what if we just used one mapping system to essentially just make this whole all easier and use photos and stuff like that to verify that we've actually done the work um and gps verify that we've done everything and they were kind of yeah no i don't think we'll do that but i kind of just pushed with it anyways um but at a certain point, I realized, too, I was like, these guys, I don't think are going to let me do this internally at any point in time. And they don't care to do it any turn internally at any point in time. They don't want to do any better than they're already doing, um, which is how a lot of companies are. It's, we're, it's not even reinventing the wheel. It's making the wheel like a tank tread. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's not reinventing it. But they look at it as if you're trying to put them on weird stilts or something. Mm -hmm. Um and so that's when I decided maybe I'll just make my own company and do this myself because if nobody understands any of this stuff in my area, maybe I can go and find that out. So I just kind of dove into it, um, almost hyper fixated on like 90% of this stuff and just started just eating into the data, eating into information. And I, from that point, it's like I've always been an information driven person. I've always been like really into technology and really into like how do I find out 
realistic information because I've always wanted to do the right thing even if I know I'm going to be wrong at some point in time. Like I'm willing to fail to succeed forward, if you will. Um, so I always go by, at least for my, my information collection method for disseminating this stuff to myself, um, is I go by a rule of threes as like a generalized method. Is um, If you want to look for information, try to find condensed information in three different sources. Better yet, if they're opposing sources, if you can find... You know, like, for instance, if we compare it to politics, if you can find a Republican source, a Democratic source, and a liberal source that all say the same thing, it might be true. There might be some truth to it. Still vet it, continue finding new sources from it, but now you have a baseline to go off of. Um, and that's kind of the idea is you would, I would go through and it'd say, hey, can I find land surveyor sources? Can I find other things can I find whatever you know to try to culminate this data and I was like you know what now I need to figure out what construction companies want need and what's their pain points and so I ended up joining the associated group of contractors with my company so they deal with like Garco construction and stuff like that and 90% of that was like I know I might not get a lot of business from it because I'm just one man trying to push out on this but if I'm going to find out what anybody wants, I need to go directly to the source. And that's the only way I can get all of the companies in town in one place that I know I can actually gather this information and figure out if I'm right, if I'm wrong, what's the pain points and just go through it and just have the courage to fail. Because that's the only way you're going to ever succeed in another way. I mean, think about it this way. is like, yes, we have, we have colleges to be able to teach skills, but a lot of these skills aren't learned in this kind of like pull, like full, full, like culmination, if you will. Um, most of our, our, our human society has learned by experience and by doing the right thing when we have the capability. And so that's kind of my methodology in learning is you could either go to college, spend a lot of time, and maybe it won't even teach you whatever you need. It might, but it might not. Um, or you can go out there and do it as long as the viability is there and you stay within the rules and bounds and limitations. It's like, there's certain things I can't do because I'm not a land surveyor. I can't go to the city and be like, this topo is real. You know, <laughs> I'll get in big trouble for that. And I understand that, that there's a reason for that and a rhyme for that. Um, but I can help the professional get better land surveys. You know, I can help a land surveyor make a survey instead of last days, weeks, months, last it, you know, a day two days, you know? So that's what I started pushing out on is trying to find out how I could get good information and, and, and culminate it back into the same place. And I still do it to this day. Like I will still go out there and look for sources like, uh, like the Aspers, the association for photogrammetry and laser scanning, I believe. Um, and look at their standards and say, am I, am I, doing this to the standard of this organization? Am I doing this to the standard of like what a land surveyor for, would do? Is this how this function still works? And I will always continue to go back and re-educate myself on something just to make sure that I'm correct on it. Cause I don't ever want to be, I want to be transparent to the customer and let them know what I don't know. But if I do know something, I want to let them know that I can absolutely do that no matter what. So it's, it's constant learning constant constant learning constant analytical like premise very meticulous attention to detail stuff and, but some of it's too just you have to have a baseline to go off of it's <laughs> it's it's it, it, it sucks because there's unfortunately there has been a, kind of a lie to when it comes to like droning is that it's just really easy to do the job if you're getting into the data portion of it um but it's not as easy as it seems. You either have to be really dedicated or have a lot of skills already on the back end to help bolster yourself so you can go forward on that. And you really got to understand spatially how it all mixes together. Because otherwise, you know, you're just, a, you're just a guy with a sky camera. And that's that. Like, you could be a really good guy with a sky camera, but unless you know your customer base, like, you're just a guy with a sky camera. <laughs> so... Yeah, that's that's kind of how that all came to be. That is awesome. Yeah. So you saw a true you you truly innovated. You're like, I see the technologies there. Mm -hmm. Nobody else is using it around here. Yeah. I'm tired of people not using this. I'm gonna do it myself. 
and you've basically <laughs> have turned yourself into an amateur data scientist yeah. where you're going out and you're trying to literally pull big data. Yeah. And it seems like the whole concept of aerial intelligence as an aerial intelligence yeah. uh, as a service is really freaking awesome because mm -hmm. you're able to collect this data. I wonder if you even give the, I wouldn't even give the customer the option to say, I'm going to own this or they're mm -hmm. going to own it. I'd say, I'm going to own this data. This is going to go into my repositories mm -hmm. and then it's going to go to my collection of data for that. I could sell later if you wanted to sell yeah. it for whatever reason. Yeah. And at least for right now, I I'm like, Hey, if you want to own the data, that's, you know, that's totally up to you just because, you know, small company trying to push out there and help them out. If they want to have that data, then, you know, it's part of the project. Um, maybe eventually I might get to that point because one of the things I do want to long term, long term, um, is I would love to be able to make training programs mm -hmm. for companies using the 3D data. Sounds um, like that's a great future. Because yeah. Because if you had to pioneer your own learning experience, there's no degrees mm -hmm. in this. No, there there isn't. And the way I see it is like there's there are very interesting engineering problems that the only way that somebody's going to learn from it is by having a captured moment of it. So if you can capture that moment in three dimensions and then actually have data to say this is how this engineer succeeded and or failed at this, that can be preserved for a company or for a college somewhere down the line um, that they can pull from and just inject a student into an experience like that. Or on the flip side of, you know, not necessarily like a college, but like a company for training programs. Um, let's go down to the basic portion, flaggers. Mm -hmm. uh, flaggers yeah, are... Yeah, to a flagging course once. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you, you go to the flagging course, you get a card, and it's like a day long or whatever. Mm -hmm. I've done the same thing. Um, if you ever get hired onto a flagging company though, they're usually, you're either hiring somebody off of the street or they're hiring, you know, some, they'll give them the training course or they'll hire somebody from a union hall or whatever. If you've never been flagging before, which flagging has a humongous turnover, um, you, a lot of times from what I've heard from the people who own those companies, it's like, it's really hard to keep people on the job site when you finally put them on a highway and they have no idea what they're doing. Like mm. they are baffled by the amount of traffic flow by the people that are there, by whatever, you know, just it's really hard to be able to keep people in that situation because it's hot. It's, you know, you're, you, people are angry around you. Um, you're on a highway where people are going 60 miles an hour. It's rough. It's really not an easy job. Um, even though you're standing there, it's really not an easy job. Um, being able to at least capture a highway project and then put them digitally in that and try to try to emulate the environment is a great way to be able to at least get them exposed to it. So when they get onto the highway, they're like, okay, this is the same as the VR training, like somewhat similar. It's still way hotter than it was in VR training, but <laughs> at least I understand how to deal with these scenarios. And at least then you could even, I mean, for, for, for a job that is that um, essentially, you know, kind of, the baseline for like a construction industry, you could essentially ship some guy a, a headset, say, put this on, do the VR training. Um, so they could do it in the comfort of their own home. They get the concept of what's going on with the job site. And then when they go onto the job site, not only do they have a basic understanding of what's going on, um, but now whenever you, the actual, you know, the, the flagger, um, the guy who's in charge can, go up to them and say, hey, we're going to do extended training from your VR headset, and this is how you deal with these other situations. At least now they have a concept of this is how fast these cars are going. These are what these people might say to me, do to me, because um, there's there's been flaggers who have had you know guns pulled on them just because they're stopping traffic, mm -hmm. which is their job, mm -hmm. because it's a safety issue. Mm -hmm. So it's like, can you expose them to that in a safe environment without them being thrown onto a highway at 60 miles an hour and 100 mile, or in 100 degree heat, and then some dude comes by and pulls a gun on them and yeah. is like, hey, so I need to go through. they're at least exposed to it once, and they yeah. won't go into shock. Yes. And, and it makes me think about how the military has this thing called the ISMIT. Yes, the yes. Simulated marksmanship trainer. Yep. And we've got, we still got so many more of them too. And we're starting to integrate more VR stuff 
into the yeah. training. You know, the army's always yeah. had the better VR shit. The oh yeah, Corps did. The Marine Corps is more like freaking duck hunt. <laughs> duck, duck hunt. hunt compared to. Pretty sure they still use duck hunt. <laughs> compared to what the army's got, the army's got sexy three hundred and sixty shoot room. Oh yeah, sort of stuff. All sorts of stuff, and like that's that's the thing is it's like I see I see a lot of value in VR training, mm-hmm. and especially being able to like for a construction company capture a site and say. Now you can put your guys through a, a VR course um, or revisit it or, you know, do do instead of just sitting them in front of a computer and saying, hey, just read through this and click a button, like put them through something that they're going to remember because they're not going to remember regurgitating a button click. I've done that so many times in the military. I don't remember anything from it. Like I remember everything I went through on a course. I remember all the VR training that I did. Like I still remember the um like the Bradley and Humvee VR training that we would do. You put a little headset on and then you're you're inside of like your your mm-hmm. inside of your Bradley or you're gunning in your Bradley it or was something. A fun video game it experience. was a fun video game and it was an experience. That's the mm-hmm. big thing, is it turned and it's funny because you're like uh, what was it? I've I've heard this a couple of times, is people say, Can you gamify your job? People are like, Oh no, no, I can't gamify a job. The military gamified their the career. Mm-hmm. Can you gamify construction? And the answer is yes. You absolutely can. Like uh, I've seen the simulators for like construction operator equipment. Mm-hmm. They've got that gamified. And then I recently saw that I think it was Trimble. I think it was Trimble. They came out with a video game that looked like Sim City, but it was for stormwater management. Hmm. So you could play around with like a simulation of stormwater management. Like, Hey, I've got these high grounds and low grounds. And then I put this here and Oh, look, this whole neighborhood's flooding out. Cause I forgot to put this network system there. So you would build like utilities and in all honesty, I could see that being a, an actual video game. If power washer simulator is a video game, uh, I could absolutely see like utility manager simulator being a video game. hundred mm-hmm. percent. I could, I would play that game. I would hold totally play that game. Um, but I genuinely think that like a lot of the stuff we do in construction, we don't think about it because it's like, oh, you're just making money. Like you're here to do a project, but you can absolutely gamify. I would say about 80% of everything you do in construction. Um, and there's there's a great way to be able to um, to train people in that method, you know, and to tie that back to like the reality capture portion of like, like that, that's perfect. If you can get a company um, to capture their entire job site and then gamify everything that they do internally, um, for whatever their processes are or being able to help with new equipment or anything like that. Like you have now a library, almost a codex, if you will, of all of the uh, ways that you can train an employee. And all you have to do is just give them the headset and they, they can get trained with it. Like, there you go. That gives them a baseline. And then you could have somebody else, you know, train the rest from there. But that's helps establish quick uh, baselines for them to be able to to use their stuff or, or, or gain knowledge, if you will. Mm-hmm. So their actual mm-hmm. doing, and and you know it makes me think about why. Do, it only seems like it would be the future. Yeah, that some county inspector somewhere is going to have some sort of a database mm-hmm. where ev- where he doesn't even go to the site. Yeah, where they just rely on individuals like you. To feed them the data sets and then they just pull it up yeah. and inspect it from there and they give their seal of approval yeah. virtually and never even once step onto it. Exactly. And it's and they're kind of doing that. Like I've heard from some guys that they'll do um, video calls with the inspector and they'll just show the inspector around the room of what they worked on. And the inspector will be like, oh, hey, go, go back to this. And then they'll make a note and be like, hey, this is how you need to fix it. And so it's like it's kind of like already virtual. This would just be the next iteration step or another layer of that too, where you go through the whole project, you capture everything, and then the inspector will give you a call about the one thing that they saw that was off. So instead of you having to take time out of that, you just have the collector goes through, collects everything, the inspector then does the inspection, and then gives the call on all the notes of like all the things they saw wrong and all the things they saw right. Done. That's it. It saves a lot of time means that one or two people from the crew doesn't have to sit there and go through everything. You just essentially have your recon guy go through and do all the collection for you and then facilitate that for all the other professionals. Like, that's virtual digital construction. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, I see this yeah. going LIDAR going for, like, 
if you were to get your home appraiser license, yeah, which is like way more valuable than it seems for than the real estate license, because yeah. everybody needs their homes appraised more than anything. This is true. Um, that could be cool, but you would have to get lenders to agree that your lidar system was good, or they might even more agree because they're like, "What? You punched through this home and you yep. saw that there is." The termite damage? No, uh-huh. We aren't approving this. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, this home. You, know, oh, you know what I just saw the other day on LinkedIn? Um, speaking of punching through the home, like I saw there's this handheld uh, x-ray scanner that like you could put it up against that wall and actually just see what's in the wall. Oh, no shit. Yeah. And like, so God it's, damn time. yeah, and so it was, it's, it's primarily uh, for like law enforcement and military because it's like, hey, you'll take like a, like a. Oh, it was showing like a, um, what is it called? A fire extinguisher. And you could, you could x-ray the fire extinguisher oh, and see so what's can punch through metal. Yes. Yes. It says, so one of their big, their big model can pu- punch through up to a quarter inch of steel. That's awesome. Yeah. And so I'm just thinking not as the military portion, but like this, mm-hmm. like a, like a, like an, like an apartment building, a house or whatever, like you could have that 3d laser scan confirm that everything is there and then say hey let's go ahead and take the x-ray scanner scan the wall oh hey look it's right there that's a double confirmation of what's actually there so now you know exactly what's going on Mm -hmm. you get the good generalized location through the laser scanner if not precise location um and then even more precise because now you can confirm it with the the x-ray scanner so like Mm -hmm. data layering it's here's all the studs they're all 18 inches apart exactly yeah and you can with laser scanners get that accurate um, shoot for with the, with the drone that I was using on the, uh, on the North South freeway, I was able to measure out a two by four and I knew it was three, three and a half inches. Cause that's how much, that's how long, how wide a two by four is. It's three and a half inches. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I really was, was pretty proud of I'm like, yeah, that is a hundred percent exactly how, how big that's supposed to be. Like it's the little things. Yeah. It's the little things. And I'm like, I think I flew that at like 150 feet or something like that. hundred feet. No, 200 feet, 200 feet. Yeah, I flew that project at 200 feet, and I was still able to measure 3.5 inches of a of a two by four. <laughs> like pretty good. Um, yeah, so that's that that's that's where I think a lot of the data is being he- like heading to. I really do, um, and that's kind of why I was like, "There's nobody else who wants to do this," and that's why I'm I'm struggling and striving to ensure that I stay as latched onto this industry as possible. Because at some point. It's not a. It's not even me thinking that it's going to pop off. It's the fact that I want to be there and barking in people's ears about it as much as possible and showing that it actually works, um, which is kind of a fool's errand in all honesty. But at the same time, I, I want to be there for that. And the only reason I say it's a fool's errand is um, mostly because companies really, really don't like change. Mm. And so when you go up to them like, hey, this thing works, they're like, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So... I'm going to be the the barking like chihuahua that just sits there and says, Hey, it actually works. I'm still here. It actually works. <laughs> like, <laughs> no, I feel yeah. you. That's, yeah. That's how I feel when I find things out with like data and yeah. stuff. But uh, that, this is a really exciting, it's a really exciting industry yeah. for you to be in. And I think your story is very unique. Yes. And it's one that's going to be really cool to follow. Uh, we've been going two and a half hours now. So Yes. Um, where can people find you? Okay. You can find me. Uh, let's see. Uh, so my website, uh, scoutaerialsolutions.com. You can also find me on LinkedIn. I'm actually huge, huge on LinkedIn. Um, it's just John Romero. Or you can also follow my company, scoutaerialsolutions.com. Or... Now also the full-time company that I work with, uh, Moss Geospatial Solutions on there too, where we sell laser scanning equipment. So personal company does the services for it. The other company I work for does all the sales of it. Um, Which is a good yes. good partnership because you can get some discount equipment. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Time. So, so over time. Good deals. Mm-hmm. And the networking experience and too. The networking. And then there's, a, there's actually a lot of people who, even though I encounter them and they're, I say, hey, I can do these services for you. They're like, you know, we would rather just buy the equipment. Like we don't, we don't want to pay a service guy. And I'm like, win-win. <laughs> it's a, this is pretty great. Hey, do you... He wants laser scanning equipment, so and I believe I believe in all the products that he has too. So, at, that's a fantastic win there. Um, 
but yeah, so like you can find me find me on LinkedIn. Um, I think I have a YouTube channel, but I haven't been active on it in a mm-hmm. hot minute. Um, and then I'm also on Facebook. I'm less active on Facebook, but I do have a Facebook on there. That that'd just be Scout Aerial Solutions doc or at Facebook. So that those are pretty much all the little avenues. I am on uh, on Google, as I do have a website. So, <laughs> yep. do you have a Google Business Profile? I do have a Google Business Good. Profile. Yeah. Good. I love I'll, the Google Business. I'll profile. give you five stars. I'll give you a comment. Fantastic. I need all the reviews I can get. Yes. I sent out reviews a long time ago, and, and uh, I haven't. I've only got like one review out of it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I was like, gosh, dang it, guys! It's hard when you're trying to go after larger businesses, and you're like, hey, can you give me? Can you give me a review? And they're like. No. <laughs> well, it's rough. <laughs> well, I will plug all of those video uh, in the video description. I'll have all those links. Be sure to check out all of John's information and links in the video description below. Be sure to like, subscribe, and smash that bell for more data driven updates. Goodbye. Thank you.